on YouTube. I am ready. It is loading through now. Good morning. Welcome to the Joint Standing Committee on Labor and Housing. My name is Craig Hickman. I represent Senate District 14, which are 11 towns in Southern Kennebec County, including my hometown of Winthrop. Today, we are here to have a public hearing on LD 553. Um, I just wanna go over a few ground rules. I know there are a lot of repeat testifiers here, but there are folks who will be listening in from all over. And so if you bear with me for one second, this is again, the Joint Standing Committee on Labor and Housing. This committee is assembled electronically today for the purposes of inviting public comment. Um, so I, I apologize for the interruption. I just loaded through the live stream and for some reason it's showing our meeting for Monday. So I'm going to end it and try to start it again. There's like a key that they have to put. I apologize for that. Just let me know. Sure. <laughs> I'm gonna give LIO a call in a second and see if they can fix it on their end. Cause I don't think it's anything I can do. Thank you. On the topic of labor, I'm going to report that about seven eighths of my two cords of wood have been stacked by <laughs> myself. Beautiful sunny weather, I've been enjoying it. Congratulations. You can. Was that in oh, labor? Was on a, I, for some reason, I seem to be in as an attendee on one, on my other. I don't know what happened. Is there a, I couldn't tell from a, the recent emails which link to use. So am I using the wrong link on one of my? You are, but I did the same thing. Alyssa will fix you when she gets back in. You, you she'll put you in so you're, you're fully in. Okay, we are live, committee members, the public. My name is Craig Hickman. Welcome to the Joint Standing Committee on Labor and Housing. I represent Senate District 14, 11 towns in Southern Kennebec County. The committee is assembled here today electronically on Zoom for the purposes of inviting public comment on legislation. Before we get started, I wanna share this information so that everyone who's listening, even if you have done this before, understands how this is gonna go. We are being live streamed on the committee's YouTube channel. That means that anyone who is participating in this meeting via Zoom can be seen and also heard if their microphone is unmuted. People on the Zoom meeting waiting to testify have seen or heard, uh, will be seen or heard when they are called upon to speak. We will record this meeting and available to view on the committee's YouTube channel soon after the meeting has concluded. In a moment, I will have committee members introduce themselves, but before I do, I will ask everyone to please mute themselves so that we have better streaming. This would also be a good time to adjust the name on your Zoom account so that we can identify you. If you, for instance, have signed up to testify by name, but all we see is iPhone or my father's laptop, it might take an extra effort to get you into our virtual podium. Please be patient. Technical issues do arise. Um, you should know that it may momentarily appear as though you have been dropped from the meeting when you are called to speak because it takes a second or two to get you into the room, but rest assured you we will appear and we'll, and we'll be able to provide your testimony. So now I'm going to ask committee members to introduce themselves. And I'm gonna start with who I see on my screen first, Representative Drinkwater. Wow, thank you. I'm not used to being first. <laughs> Representative, uh... Gary Drinkwater, representing District 121, five towns of uh, Elton, Argyle, Corinth, Hudson, Elton, and of course, my hometown of uh, Milford. Representative Pebworth. Good morning, everyone. I'm Sarah Pebworth. I represent House District 133 in the Blue Hill Peninsula. That includes Blue Hill, Brooksville, Brooklyn, Castine, Sedgwick, and Surrey. Representative Cuddy. Good morning, my name is Scott Cuddy. I represent House District 98, which is Winterport, Frankfort, Searsport, and Swanville. Senator Miramont. Good morning, nice to see everyone. Dave Miramont, Senator for Senate District 12, which is Knox County with the county seat of Rockland. And it does not include the town of Washington, the only one in the county. Representative Rader. 
Hi, I'm Representative Amy Rayner. I represent Maine House District 125, which is a portion, the best portion of Bangor. Representative Sylvester. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is uh, Representative Mike Sylvester. I represent District 39, which is the Eastern Peninsula portion and the peace-loving islands of Casco Bay. I am uh, the House Chair of this committee, and uh, I usually do the timing, but since the bill is mine today, uh, Representative Pebworth will be doing the timing. She will hold up the phone uh, at the beginning to see that it has started. You, everybody has three minutes, and so uh, when it gets to 30 seconds, she'll hold it up again and then politely interrupt you uh, at the end of three minutes to let you know to summarize your thoughts. And uh, we appreciate you all being here today. Representative Gear. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm Tracy Gear, representing District 9, which is Kennebunkport and the coastal parts of Biddeford and Kennebunk. And I'm happy to hear that the fighting islands of Casco Bay have made peace. Representative Warren. Good morning. I'm Representative Sophia Warren, and I represent my hometown here in Scarborough Coastal District 29. Representative Prescott. I'm Wayne Prescott, House District 17. That would be Waterboro and part of London. Thank you, committee members present for introducing yourselves. We also have with us today, Alyssa Thompson, our committee clerk, who is the maestro who will be letting you in and out of the room to testify and our analyst, Mr. Stephen Langley. It will be graciously appreciated that when you are done offering your testimony to this committee, that you exit the Zoom meeting so that we have more bandwidth for everyone else who is going to participate. You can continue to watch the hearing on our YouTube channel. If you do need to exit the meeting before being called upon to testify, please be aware that you may submit written testimony at any time by accessing the legislature's testimony submission page. This meeting is being broadcast again and recorded on YouTube and can also be heard over the legislature's audio broadcast system. Any testimony you submit is public, may be posted on the legislature's website and therefore part of the record. As my co-chair said earlier, you will have three minutes to present your testimony today. We do have more than 35 people signed up to testify, so we will try to keep you strictly to the three minutes. When your time <laughs> is up, we will remind you to summarize your comments. And a gentle reminder to the committee members, this is an opportunity for us to hear from the public. Um, I know that we will have a work session and we can get into all of our stories and our debates around this issue. So I'm going to, to gently ask that if you ask a testifier a question, it be a direct question, a clarifying question, and only a clarifying question so that we can hear from the public today. With that said, I will open the public hearing on LD 553, an act to end at will employment sponsored by the good representative from Portland representative Sylvester. Representative. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Hickman and all my esteemed colleagues of the Committee on Labor and Housing. My name is Representative Mike Sylvester. I represent the Eastern Peninsula portion of Portland and the peace loving islands of Casco Bay. I'm here to introduce LD 553, an act to end at will employment. I wanna quickly explain LD 553, which is a simple bill with many opportunities to misunderstand it. Why? because LD 553 is about change. And change is always difficult, it's scary, it's worrisome, and a challenge to those upon whom the change is being affected. In this case, what we're doing is changing a power imbalance between workers and employers by ending at-will employment. It standardizes the need to have a progressive discipline policy, and it creates a need to have a cause to fire workers and to notify them of that cause. That's all it does those four things. It ends at will employment, standardizes progressive discipline, requires a cause for termination, requires you to notify the employee why they were fired. And I'm gonna walk through each one of these. So what is at will employment? Well, here's a definition. At will employment describes a working environment in which employers are free to terminate, terminate employees at any time without cause, explanation, or prior warning, provided it does not violate state and federal anti-discrimination laws. Essentially, you can't fire someone specifically because of their race, age, gender, sexual orientation, or gender identity, et cetera. 
The burden of proof is on the employee to prove that that was the reason they were fired. So it isn't easy to prove. Yet otherwise than that, the employer can let an employee go for any reason or for no reason. That's at will. Do all employers fire people for no reason? No, nope. and that's not what I'm saying. Do some employers fire people for no reason? Yes, I hear from them all the time and I have to tell them that there is no law to protect them. Is it right that people should go to work and worry that today is the day they will be fired for no reason? In my mind, the answer is no, it's not, but I'll go into that in greater detail later in my testimony. So what is progressive discipline? Again, a definition. Progressive discipline is the series of steps a supervisor or human resources representative uses to document and coach an employee who's not performing to the company's set standard. These policies are generally used as a way to clearly communicate an issue with the employee and create a plan of action that helps the employee improve their overall work performance. So it's nothing scary. It's the kind of coaching that happens at all good employers right now. It is an agreement between an employee and an employer that something didn't go right and that both sides want to fix it. It's not overwhelming or burdensome. It is merely the recognition that people make mistakes. And so it's a system to formalize everyone's efforts to be better. Now, many companies already have a progressive dis discipline policy similar or better than that detailed in LD 553. If you do, then you will continue to follow that policy. There will be no change for your company. Let me repeat, if you have a progressive discipline policy, then you will continue to follow that policy. There will be no change for your company. All LD 553 demands is that, a certain, that it has certain requirements and that you follow the three steps in documentation. For those who do not have a policy, LD 553 requires the DLL to complete, the Department of Labor to complete a template policy so that they will have a policy. Follow that policy and you're done. Well, it's not a part of this legislation. I will be requesting that DOL provide a progressive discipline and discrimination training as their capacity allows, capacity being the key word. These DOL classes are generally free and will probably be a great thing for new managers to take. So what is just cause? This is slightly harder. Essentially, did you have a reason to fire someone? In 1966, an arbitrator named Carol Daugherty created a standard of seven tests and Daugherty's seven tests are as follows. Was the employee forewarned of the consequences of his or her actions? Are the employee's rules reasonably related to business efficiency and the performance the employer might reasonably expect from the employee? Was an effort made before discipline or discharge to determine whether the employee was guilty as charged? Was the investigation conducted fairly and objectively? Did the employer obtain substantial evidence of the employee's guilt? Were the rules applied fairly and without discrimination? Was the degree of discipline reasonably related to the seriousness of the employee's offense and the employee's past record? Now, the most important of these rules are number one, followed by number two. Do you have rules? Did you notify the employee of those rules? Did you not change them on a whim, but keep them pretty standard? If you notified employees of your rules and they broke them, you may discipline them as long as you do it fairly and roughly the same for everyone. Employee, employment law is not uh, like chemistry. Uh, there's a lot of wiggle room, but that wiggle room generally goes to latitude on uh, the part of the employer. If this seems like an incredible burdensome requirement that everyone's treated fairly and, and roughly the same, setting rules for your employees and applying them somewhat evenly, then perhaps propose that proposed DOL class is for you. Now, what do I mean by somewhat fairly? Two people come in late for the first time, both notified the employer that they would be late, one receives no discipline and one is fired. That would be somewhat less than fair. So in review of LD 553, have rules, make sure your employees know them and that those rules stay roughly consistent. If you have a progressive discipline policy, then follow it. 
If you do not have a progressive discipline policy, well, now you do. You have the state template, and so you follow that. If you need to discipline or fire someone, have a reason and be roughly fair in its application. And that's it. Now, it may surprise you that I have received a piece or two of mail about this bill, expressing some concerns. They were pretty much the same concerns crafted by someone, but I'll tackle three or four of these now. LD 553, the concern says, will not allow a business to have seasonal layoffs. That is incorrect. First of all, a planned layoff is not the same as a termination. A seasonal layoff is a planned event. Even if it was an unplanned reduction of force, the fact that your business is shutting down and reducing staff is a cause, a just cause. Now apply the layoffs evenly, such as by seniority or by part-time, full-time, and you've met just cause. You just have to have a method to your reduction. It will be impossible to fire anyone, and that's incorrect. Will it be impossible to fire someone because a manager is having a bad day? It will be harder to. Will it be impossible to fire someone who comes in late several times? No. You just need to document it. Will it be impossible to fire someone because you don't care for the way they look? It'll be harder to do that. Will it be impossible to fire someone if they steal, come in drunk, threaten violence, or scream obscenities at customers? No. There are already laws in place which allow wide latitude to employers in all those areas. Three, the point has been made to me that if LD 553 becomes law that no one will ever hire anyone again. I believe the terms that were used were a freeze or a severe dampening on hiring. And that's interesting to me because I sit on the state workforce board and been a member of this committee for five years and the house chair for three years. And I continue to hear how difficult it is for people to hire employees. I hear about the great lengths that employers of this state go to to attract, train and retain employees and how the need is for more not fewer qualified employees. And I believe all of that is true. So I'm making this one, I'm taking this one with a grain of rhetorical salt. That's in fact why I have three bills in to rebuild both the new and existing manufacturing base and to rebuild the public workforce. So I think qualified employees will still get hired. Now I've been told that workers will not come to the state of Maine if we put on more burdensome rights. I suppose that worker who wants to go to work every day and know that if they work hard and follow the rules, that the law will guarantee that they get a fair shake, those folks are still gonna come. But those workers who prefer to have their lives entirely out of control with any, without any sets of fair rules in the statute, I guess they will go somewhere else. But that's really what this comes down to. Right now, the scales are tipped entirely towards employers, and it's hard to be an employer. I'm an employer. It's a difficult job. There's a lot of calls. But in fact, the whole point, that's why people join unions. The whole point of having a union is that it evens the scale. Yet for non-union workers, the employer gets to say who and how and why and how much and for how long, and LD 553 still keeps the scales on the employer's side. But it says the measurement the measurement of those scales have to be done fairly. What happens if it isn't? Well, there is no private right of action in LD 553. If workers want a system of arbitration, they will still need to form a union. The only private right of action allowed is on process. The things that I mentioned above, rules, systems, and did you follow them? I didn't put damages in the bill because I figure that we already have judges. They good, do a good job, in my opinion, of these matters. I won't try to do their job. I assume that some will say the legislation is too vague. Again, that's because I didn't put in uh, you know, damages. Again, that's interesting, because when legislators put in penalty, they are described as being too prescriptive. That's mostly legislative rhetoric. If folks come behind me and have good constructive solutions that they would like to see in this bill to make this bill a better bill, I will be the first one to be happy to consider them. As a committee, we always wanna know if a law has been tried elsewhere. There is no at-will status in the state of Montana and in the territories of Puerto Rico, 
and the Virgin Islands. Montana's law is largely reliant on private right of action and fought in the courts. I think lawyers have enough work. Uh, I think that uh, you know we don't need to fill our, our cases, our uh, lawsuit, our uh, courts uh, with more cases. And if you look up at Will Employment Montana, the first 50 things you'll get are attorneys. LD 553, however, relies instead on our main employers to institute a fair system. The systems in the Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico are closer to those considered here. I'll be happy to give you any information that I can about them and other states, but you can know that I considered them in drawing up what I thought was a system that was right for Maine workers and Maine employers. Lastly, I often start testimony in other committees with my intent in putting in a bill. And today I'm gonna to close with it. My mother was a single mother of three. Never made more than $14,000 a year in her life doing a job trying to help people. Yet she had a supervisor who relished in making her life miserable. Nothing my mother ever did was explained, but also it was never right. My mom was ridiculed in front of her coworkers and superiors. She dreaded going to work every day, but the health insurance and the promise of a scholarship for her kids, including her erstwhile and somewhat strange thinking son, kept her punching the clock. Eventually, she was fired with a number of other older workers, in her case, two months from vesting her pension and without cause. Now, I didn't write this bill because of my mom and her situation, yet I became a union organizer and negotiator and a legislator because of it. In my work life, I saw the real benefit, what going to work every day with a sense of security gives to people. Knowing that you can go in and do your best, no matter who you are, what you look like, or even if you aren't the kind of person people generally like, no matter what your political persuasion or home life, and you get a fair shake for a fair day's work. That's all this bill wants for Maine workers. As a small seasonal employer myself, it's what I try to give to my employees. It's what I believe that most Maine employers want to give to their workers, but it's what LD 553 guarantees in law. So with that, I thank you for your time and attention, attention, and I will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Representative Sylvester. We will now take questions from the committee. Representative Cuddy. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Sylvester, for the bill. Um, in some of the testimony uh, that I read and some of the in, uh, correspondence I received, employers were concerned that they would not be able to fire somebody without a progressive discipline policy if that individual broke the law in their workplace. Um, it seems to me reading in the termination for cause section that if somebody does break a state law that they can actually be fired with nothing more than the written notice being sent to the, the person who's fired if they've broken a law. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct. And, and I think that one of the things that's, that's hard, and you know, my testimony was long enough, uh, but I think that one of the things that's hard to, to discuss, and I had a conversation with an employer this morning who was wondering about probationary periods, right? And that's kind of both end of the scale. So someone walks in and, and threatens violence against a customer or against a fellow employee, that, that we already have laws for that, that you can terminate that person um, under, and that is just cause, right? And, and you just, all you need to do is, is notify them that they've been terminated, right? Uh, the same for probation periods. Right. I, I think it's, it's sort of obvious to me, uh, but probably not obvious to everybody that uh, probation periods, whether it's 90 days or, or, or six months, um, is a period of at will that, that is usually written into a progressive discipline policy. Uh, and so those things are still acceptable. And I'm going to actually follow in that conversation. As I said, I am absolutely open to good ideas. And so that a good idea came in this morning to make that clearer. And so I'm gonna offer an amendment on that to say that it, just to make it clear that probationary periods are still uh, acceptable because you need a period of time to figure out whether someone's gonna work. But yes, if you have a reason, you can let someone go. And most employers in my mind, as I said, wanna coach their employees to keep them. It costs too much to bring them in. It costs too much to train them. They do everything they can to keep them there. And so uh, this just sort of 
catches all the uh, all, all the folks who fall through the cracks there. And thank you for the question. Representative Drinkwater. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So we're celebrating our bicentennial, 200 years of being a state. So uh, you're, you're proposing to underdo 200 years of standard practice. You mentioned about uh, probation period. Uh, we just had discussion on LD 648, the apprenticeship, apprenticeship programs. What about probationary for apprenticeships? I mean, as you know, those could take a couple of years. So employment law is employment law. And, and usually uh, folks in apprenticeship programs already have sets of rules and all of those sorts of things that you must follow. So if you don't show up, if you can't, do, if you don't, can't meet the benchmarks and all that, um, but generally, you know, as we talked about in that bill, there, there's a pretty strong federal law in terms of you know, all of the different things that need to uh, be followed for, for just discrimination. Um, but I'm not really, to be honest with you, that worried about apprenticeships. Apprenticeships already have strict guidelines. Um, if you wanted to offer a friendly amendment, Representative Drinkwater, and that would bring about your support, I'd be happy to think about a way that we can make that explicit. Well, I personally think you should uh, cover apprentice apprentices under probationary period. So that's my friendly amendment. Thank I you. I appreciate that. I'd be happy to think about it. Are there any other questions from the committee for the bill sponsor? Seeing none. Thank you, Representative Sylvester. Thank um, you so much, committee. I appreciate all your time today considering this bill and I, and I look forward to uh, continuing work and I look, you look forward to my being quiet the rest of the day. Thank you. We will now take a question, uh, testimony from the public. We will start with testimony in favor of the bill, move to testimony in opposition to the bill and finish with testimony neither for nor against the bill. I have one, two, three, four, five, five or six people signed up to testify in favor, beginning with Adam Good, then going to Jim Durkin, Matthew Beck, Michael Mosley and Jeffrey Young. So if Mr. Adam Good would please enter the Zoom. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning, Senator Hickman and Representative Sylvester and members of the Labor and Housing Committee. My name is Adam Good. I work as the legislative and political director of the main AFL CIO. We testify in support of LD573. Uh, this bill would protect workers in Maine from being fired by their employer without cause. As an at-will state, Maine grants employers the power to fire employees at will, with the exception of issues related to protected classes like race, religion, disability status. It is the norm in all other industrialized countries to provide uh, due process rights to workers so they have the right to contest their dismissal, pursue damages, and have a fair resolution in the event that they believe they've been fired unfairly. We're in support of this change for two fundamental reasons. The first is that unions are all about raising expectations. Too often, we hear stories of workers who don't organize unions because they are afraid of being fired or losing their job. Whistleblower laws exist for the very reason that people who are in a vulnerable position stay quiet because they don't want to lose their job and by extension, their livelihood home or family. A cornerstone of most collective bargaining agreements are just cause policies similar to what this bill seeks to extend to all workers in Maine. White collar professional class employees also have just cause rights through individual contracts they often have with their employers. A working class Mainer should have the same rights as just cause. The second reason is that we believe in the basic rule of innocent until proven guilty. A due process that has causes for grounds of dismissal for actions like harassing other workers, revealing trade secrets, breaking company rules, breaking the law, uh, and has a progressive discipline system allows an employer options for addressing employee issues while protecting a worker from excessive arbitrary power of their boss. Our country is alone among industrialized nations in allowing at-will employees to be fired for arbitrary reasons. Why should an employer be able to fire someone to open up a job for their son-in-law? 
Why should workers have to worry that their boss might fire them if they don't like what they post on social media? At will employees can be fired for a good reason, a bad reason, or no reason at all. Germany, France, Japan, Sweden, the United Kingdom, all require employers to demonstrate they have just cause to dismiss non-probationary employees. Around the world, workers who believe they have been fired without a reason have a chance to fight for their job, livelihood, and reputation. Most countries and employment contracts provide models for various tests regarding notice of rules, consequences, and ensuring that rules are applied fairly. Similar changes in Maine would, protect, would put workers and employers on a more equal footing. We urge you to vote for LB553. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Good. Are there any questions from the committee? Yeah, Chair. Representative Prescott. Representative Prescott, did you have a question? Okay. Seeing no questions from the committee. Thank you. Very day. Next is Jim Durkin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee. Uh, everybody hear me okay? Yes. There's always that awkward uh, pause be beforehand. Uh, for the record, my name is Jim Durkin. I'm the legislative director for Ask Me Council 93. And I'm here today on behalf of uh, 2,600 hardworking members in Maine to express our strong support for this bill. Uh, if signed into law, the legislation would be a major step forward in providing workers who don't have the protection of a union contract with some basic fundamental protections and would require employers simply to treat people fairly and decent, decently, and I, I dare say represent how any one of us would hope to be treated by an employer. There's really not much more to add to what the chairman is, uh, uh, Chairman Sylvester has already stated, so I'd just say that in deciding whether or not you'd want to support this bill, we believe it comes down to asking yourself some basic, simple questions. Uh, if you made a mistake at work, would you want your supervisor to let you know uh, what he or she believes you did wrong and give you a fair shot of correcting your mistake going forward? If you and a coworker made the same mistake and you were immediately fired and the coworker received a slap on the wrist, would you view that as unfair? And if you were ultimately fired from your job, would you want to know the reason why, if for no other reason, so you wouldn't make the same mistake again? Uh, you know, if the answer is yes to these questions, then we believe the logical choice is to support the bill. Uh, I am uh, I'm not one to quote scripture and testimony. In fact, I can honestly say I don't believe I ever have before in 18 years of doing this job. But the words do unto others as you would have done unto you come to mind and seem to sum up this legislation quite well. I would just add that for those who may be truly worried or may claim that this legislation is some kind of a backdoor or end run around the established process required for workers who want to form a union, I can assure you that's definitely not the case. Uh, in presenting the legislation, Chairman Sylvester talked about the seven tests related to just cause. And of course, we have strong just cause provisions in our collective bargaining agreements. And for start, is fair and established disciplinary procedures are just one component of the strong collective bargaining agreements we negotiate for our members. But when it comes to just cause, we have something in our contract that this legislation doesn't have, and that's uh, arbitration. Assuming all steps in the grievance process outlined in the contract are exhausted, and the union and employer are still in disagreement over whether or not a termination was justified, we have the ability to bring the matter before an independent arbitrator, which is costly, but the employee's cost is covered by the union. As uh, Chairman Sylvester noted, in this legislation, any employee who believes they were wrongfully terminated would have the option of seeking relief in the courts, but this would clearly be a far more cumbersome process and one that would be beyond the financial reach of many. But maybe, just maybe, codifying this process into law would result in employers pausing and reflecting before making a rash or punitive decision that was simply too harsh. So I thank you for your time and consideration, uh, and congratulations, uh, Mr. Chairman, on your historic election, and I'll do my best to answer any questions you may have. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the time. Are there any questions? I pop. We'll get a hand up. Oh, uh, okay. 
Mr. Mr. Chair, your microphone seems to be having a problem. I don't know if anybody else can hear, but I can't hear Senator Hickman much at all. Oh, just be buffering. Can you hear me? A little bit. Uh, is anyone other than Representative Cuddy having a problem hearing me? You just yeah. came back loud and clear. Sort of, kind of. Is that better? Having, ha having trouble on my end, Mr. Chairman. That's better, though. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Okay, great. I do not see any questions from the committee for you, Mr. Durkin. So thank you for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. If I could just, uh, just along the lines of technical difficulties, my colleague Jim Mackey uh, had signed up to testify, but he he, he wasn't named uh, as as one of the uh, supporters of the bill. Uh, I think he has a lot to add. Many many years of experience as a as a staff representative for us. So if we could just take care of that, I, I would appreciate it. It shall be done. Thank you. Thank thank you, sir. Next on the list is Matthew Beck. Welcome, Mr. Beck. Thank you. Good morning. I appreciate the opportunity to testify in favor of LD 553. Uh, my name is Matthew Beck. I'm an organizer and business representative for the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 1837. We're proud to represent 1,000 workers in Maine at electric utilities, television stations, and most recently at the Kittery Water District. I'm pleased to be here today in support of LD 553. Growing up in a union family, I understood from an early age that when workers join together in a union, they not only have an opportunity to negotiate to improve their wages, benefits, and working condi conditions, they also enjoy some protection from arbitrary and unfair treatment from a bad boss, someone who, for whatever reason, has decided that they don't like you or perhaps want to instill fear in the workplace to keep everyone else in line. With the protection of a union contract with its just cause and progressive discipline provisions, which are agreed to by both the management and the union and ratified in a vote by the union's members, workers can concentrate on doing the jobs they were hired to do, doing them well and doing them safely without fear that they will be disciplined or even fired for no good reason. We were pleased by the recent comments offered by President Biden supporting the rights of workers to join a union and affirming the importance of unions for all workers and for the good of the country. Unfortunately, although recent polls have shown that a majority of non-union workers would join a union if they could, until there is a major overhaul of our broken federal labor laws, most of those workers in the private sector will never have that opportunity to benefit from the just cause protections of a union contract. That seems to be unfair and unnecessary. I urge you to support LD 553 as a way to help lift those workers up and help them to achieve the peace of mind that comes with having a fair, balanced, just cause and progressive discipline standard all employers will follow. With just cause protections and without the fear of unlawful retaliation for trying to form a union at work, some of those workers may choose to take the next step and become unionized themselves, perhaps leading to better pay, better working conditions, greater safety, and better lives for themselves and their families. And I'll be happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Beck. Before we go to questions, if you would allow, I see a few more committee members have joined us and I'm gonna ask them to briefly introduce themselves. Representative Bradstreet. Representative Bradstreet, would you like to introduce yourself? You're on mute. Can people hear me? Okay. Representative Morris, would you like to introduce yourself, please? 
Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is uh, Representative Joshua Morris. I represent the towns of Turner, Leeds, and Livermore, House District 75. Thank you. Senator Guerin, would you like to introduce yourself? She must not be with us. Representative Bradstreet, would you like to introduce yourself? No, I, I am here. I was just trying to talk to her. I am Senator Stacy Guerin, representing Southern Penobscot County, Senate District 10. Thank you. Representative Bradstreet. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I am Representative Dick Bradstreet from House District 80, and that's made up of my hometown of Vassalboro, Windsor, Somerville, and part of Augusta. Thank you and welcome. And now for questions for Mr. Beck from the committee, Representative Drinkwater. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Mr. Beck. Thank you. Uh, I actually have family members that belong to your union. Uh, just a quick question. If an electrical, if an electrician shows up to work and uh, they are required to be drug tested or you can smell alcohol on their breath, is that a just cause for immediate termination? Thank you for your uh, question, Representative Drinkwater. The, um, every case is taken on a case by case basis and I'd be reluctant to give you the exact procedure that would happen from one company compared to another. Obviously, uh, no, no union has any interest in seeing workers that come to work and put themselves, the coworkers or members of the public at risk. And we take those cases very seriously. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Mr. Beck from the committee? Seeing none. Next up will be Michael Mosley, followed by Jeffrey Young, followed by Jim Mackey. Welcome, Mr. Mosley. Hello, thank you. And thank you to all the members of the Labor and Housing Committee for your time today. Um, I'm gonna make this quick. I'm not a labor organizer. I'm just a worker. Please state your name and where you are from. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, my name is my name is Michael Mosley. I'm calling in from Waterville. Thank um, you. And I'm not affiliated with any organization or anything. Um, like I was saying, I'm not a labor organizer. I've just been working all my life. Um, I started my first side hustle when I was seven years old. Uh, bring in milk to neighbors for pocket change. Uh, I worked in a clam factory at 14. Um, and I've been working in Maine for a, more than a decade now. And for me, the only thing that I can really offer right now is one of the most humiliating experiences of my life. I worked at a gas station in Gardner. And my boss decided that they didn't want it. They didn't want to hire me anymore. They didn't want me to be employed anymore. And instead of having any sort of conversation about it, I was simply just accused of having some sort of improper relations with two women in a walk-in freezer and was told that the police showed up, that people made complaints and that like I had abandoned my duties. None of this was true. All of this could have been proven by any sort of due process, but there was none and there never was gonna be any. And when I did push back and I did let people know, hey, you can't just accuse someone of this. Like this is, this is an actual serious thing that you're, you're accusing me of. What happened was we didn't sit down and have a conversation about that. They just changed their reason. They made it, oh, you stole a small cup of coffee and we don't have to justify any of this. And so now you're gone. And so then you have to, as a worker, go around trying to get a new job. And you don't know if like you can even use your prior experience because of what people have said about you. You have to take the risk of, I didn't have any due process in this, in, in any of this. And this is what they are going to say, and it is going to be legitimized because they are my employer. That is it. 
And that is the only word that will ever be said on it. And you have to try to fight back against that after the fact. It's impossible. It's an impossible situation for most workers. And it's stressful. And it is hard on people. And we shouldn't be having to deal with this and live like this as workers. We should have some basic dignity. We should have some basic respect. And we should have to be given a reason at the very least one that makes sense when we are terminated. And that's that's all I really have to say. And I'm more than happy to answer questions. Thank you, Mr. Mosley, for your testimony. Are there any questions? Representative Drinkwater. Mr. Mosley, after that uh, reg regrettable situation you found yourself in, were you able or did you pursue unemployment and were the facts, if you did apply for unemployment, did the facts come out during the process? Um, as far as I was aware, I wasn't eligible for unemployment and I didn't have time to try to go through that process. I needed a job. That's, that's how it is when you're a worker. If you, you can try and sit there and go through that bureau pro, bureaucratic process, but bills don't, don't stop when you get fired. Thank you, sir. Are there any other questions for Mr. Mosley from the committee? Seeing none, thank you for being here today to testify. Is Jeffrey Young in the room? It's apparent that he may have had court this morning and couldn't be here. And so I will give him a minute. And if I don't see him, we'll move on and come back if he shows up later. Alyssa, can you please bring into the committee room for testimony, Mr. Mackey? Yep, I did. He's here Thank now. You. Thank you. Senator Miramont. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, there's, there's a long list and of course we want everyone to have their time. Maybe you already said this, I had to testify on a bill, but it, it would be good that folks who can hear this could testify towards things that the bill actually attempts to do and or respond to the sponsor and what he said it does. And we'll make sure it's what he said it does as we do the work session, but not to an alarmist letter from some organization that didn't understand the bill or put in things about it that don't exist. We could have an extra few hours if people are testifying for things that aren't there, which I'm just reminding, but everybody should get their say if they have something that's relevant. And thank you for letting me say that. Thank you, Senator. Mr. Mackey, are you ready to testify? I am, thank you. Good morning, Senator Hickman, Representative Sylvester, members of the Committee on Labor and Housing. My name is Jim Mackey. I'm a staff representative for ASPE Council 93. Uh, we represent corrections, public works, school districts, mental health facilities in the state, in the state of Maine. Uh, I'll be brief. Uh, I send in a, a, a small letter, but I have over 35 years uh, in uh, Maine and uh, labor management and also across the uh, United States. And uh, those members that we represent are very fortunate because they are not at will employees. They, they uh, have the benefit of being protected by having uh, a labor contract, by having the rules set forth. But also I think the employers that uh, we represent, uh, if the committee was to reach out to some of them, would talk about you know, the benefits of having these sort of procedures and how uh, they have employer security in the, in the process of knowing that there are financial limits on uh, dealing with these employee employment issues. Um, that uh, you know, an employee uh, who is fully informed of what, expect, what is expected of them, uh, you know, knows the rules that they're coming into, know, knows the consequences of it, uh, reading through the bill, uh, reading through some of the testimony from some of the employers, uh, there's nothing in this bill that we can see that stops any employer from firing anybody. All it does is it establishes the groundwork under which you're going to terminate somebody's career with, with a, any certain employer. Uh, and that sort of expectation is something that all working the workforce in Maine should uh, be subject to. 
Uh, again, I think that, you know, what this law will also, it does, it, it benefits employers in the fact that they now can have a limitation on any potential liability on how they treat uh, employers. I know Representative Drinkwater brought up about uh, unemployment. Uh, if an employer has got to continually go to the unemployment bureau, then they're probably going to be, you know, using an attorney, which drives their cost up and, you know, appeals from the unemployment bureau can go on for a little while. So a simple, a simple process of setting up a progressive discipline system uh, will benefit the employer as much as it benefits the employee. If somebody comes in drunk, uh, the state already has on the books uh, laws on how employers uh, set up drug and alcohol testing procedures. Those are there today. This law doesn't impact any of those laws that are on the books as of now as to how an employee can be uh, terminated and uh, I think that uh, this would be certainly a step forward. Uh, you know, nightly we talk or we hear daily about how employers have problems with uh, hiring and retention. Uh, you know, our, our view would be that uh, an employee coming in and knowing, you know, better what the ground rules are and know what the expectations are, knowing frankly, they're gonna be treated the same as everybody else in the workforce. Uh, at will, uh, you know, whether fortunately or unfortunately, it has the connotation of one strike and you're out. Uh, and in today's environment of which it's difficult to get employees, get them trained up and get them working, that doesn't benefit any employer. And it doesn't, certainly doesn't benefit the state of Maine of trying to have full employment. With that, I will answer any questions. I know you're going to full boat here today and I don't want to take up too much of your time. Thank you, Mr. Mackey. Are there any questions from the committee? Seeing none. We will now move to testimony in opposition to LD 553. The first couple of folks who are signed up to testify are Ben Lucas, Brandon Mazur, Brian Park, and Bruce Garrity. Hello, am I up? I, uh, I cut out there when I was connecting. Yes, you are. We can see you and hear you. Thank you for being here, sir. Great. Thank you, Senator Hickman, Representative Sylvester, members of the Committee on Labor and Housing. My name is Ben Lucas. I live in Portland and I serve as the Executive Director of the Maine Jobs Council. I am here today to testify in opposition of LD 553. If this legislation passes, Maine will be only the second state to end at-will employment. The other state is Montana. This legislation would once again make Maine an outlier with the rest of the region and continue to make Maine less attractive to capital investment. Maine ranked number 40 in America for capital investment in 2019. New Hampshire sought nearly three times the investment. Capital investment is the best way to solve our state's complex economic problems. We need to start growing our, ba our tax base and increase our base of stable, good paying jobs. The best way to do this is attract investment into Maine. Maine's business climate is already incredibly difficult with high costs and high taxes. Employers need the flexibility to make employment changes if they are going to stay in business and compete successfully. The Maine Jobs Council fully supports making workers a top priority. The best way to do that is with a robust economy full of quality jobs that provide career choices, career growth, and increasing wages. This law would lead to just the reverse. Supporting working people is critical, but the important word is working. If our companies cannot compete, if money isn't invested here, if jobs stagnate or leave, then we will have more and more people who are no longer working. There is no substitute for a good job, and those jobs come from companies that can compete successfully to provide goods and services. Managers need flexibility to do that and they cannot be burdened with limitations that their competitors from other states don't carry. If we are truly going to improve the lives of Maine's working men and women, we need to help our employers be more competitive and not less. Individual pieces of legislation like the one that have been introduced to this committee today are not the solution to solving our state's economic problems. Our overall business environment is ranked number 46. We have the sixth highest energy cost burden the fourth highest healthcare cost board burden, the fourth highest tax burden, and our weekly wage is only $955. That is tied with Wyoming for 11th lowest. Our overall economic ranking is last in New England 
And if LD 553 passes, it'll be one more thing that makes it harder for our state's economy to succeed. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Mr. Lucas. Questions, Senator Miramont. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Lucas. Uh, for the work session, would you provide the source of those studies that you cite about our ranking and their political bias and uh, have that, it will probably be in about a week or probably two with our schedule, but thank you. Yep, I can certainly provide that for you. Representative Bradstreet. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Mr. Lucas, for being here. So you're actually saying that businesses do look at these statistics when they decide where to invest. Is that true? Yes, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Representative Gear. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Lucas, for being here. Um, in the introductory testimony that Representative Sylvester gave for, for this bill, um, he described that this bill would create for those companies that do not currently have a uh, progressive discipline policy, create a template at the state that would provide that to those companies so they would be able to uh, have an easy one to follow. Um, can you describe how, the number of companies that might be affected in your knowledge and how that would actually go towards increasing the cost to that company? Yeah, certainly. I, I mean, I would have to do research to get to the exact number uh, of companies that would be affected, but I can tell you, I was on the, uh, the phone this morning with one of our members, and he told me that uh, if this legislation were to pass, he will not hire anyone else in the state of Maine. He has uh, employees in business and in other states, and I think that's one of the things that uh, is missing in the in the argument. The, the businesses may not leave Maine. They, As we know, Maine is a small business state and, and our businesses have been around for a long period of time. But as the Jobs Council, we're focused on jobs and we want to keep jobs in Maine. And, and our members fear that if this legislation were to pass, it could result in, in the jobs leaving, not necessarily the businesses. But I can uh, certainly look into your specific request representative and get you more data for the work session. That would be the number of companies that do not have progressive discipline policies and how this would increase their costs. Yep, thank you for the clarification. Thank you, Representative Warren. Thank you very much. And I appreciate your testimony. I know you also submitted some uh, written testimony and I'm trying to understand. I agree with many of the observations you've made about the different long-term challenges that make basis, but uh, can you say more about where your data or anal analysis of certain information that I could look into more uh, about how this would affect those long-term um, issues? You say at one point um, in your written testimony, and I heard similar language in uh, how you still care about how it may lead to different things, and um, I, I just want to understand more about how you uh, analyze the connection between us. Certainly. Yeah, thank you for the, uh, the, represent, uh, the question, Representative Warren. And uh, as I alluded to, as Senator Miramont, I will provide the committee with uh, all the data that, that we have used to, to formulate this position. Okay, could I ask a follow-up question? May. Is there anything that you could speak to now about some, just broadly speaking, what is the uh, uh, causation would be great, but just you know, what is a strong correlation that you're uh, basing this um, understanding off of about how it could increase all these other, um, or exacerbate all these other uh, issues that we face? Yeah, um, I, if I'm having a little bit of a hard time understanding what your direct ask is, but uh, the point that we're trying to make is that there are complex economic issues in our state. And we're going to be high in having operating costs and everything else. Adding another level of regulation isn't going to help the business community be successful. We need to start taking a much more overall comprehensive look at economic challenges in our state and, and solve the issues together. Um, so I, I, again, I'm having a little bit of hard time following what your, your direct ask is, but um, 
you know, I'm, I'm more than happy to provide you with, with all the data and, um, you know, try and, and, and work through this as much as possible with you. No, that was great. I appreciate it. You're speaking to that you, your perspective broadly, if I'm understanding it, is that just greater regulation is um, the, the root of yeah. the, and yeah. I appreciate it. So I just wanted to clarify, understand that uh, perspective, and I would appreciate more data. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the committee? Representative Gear, do you have another question? Or is that from before? Okay. I believe, <laughs> Mr. Lucas, that you can remove yourself from the hot seat. Thank you for being here today. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. And Alyssa, can you please call forward the next, I, my screen froze and so I can't get my, my list. <laughs> um, Br Brenda Mazur's here now. Thank you. <laughs> it will come back up, I'm sure. Welcome, Mr. Mazur. Good to see you again. Good morning. Nice to see you again, Senator Hickman, Representative Sylvester, and esteemed members of Labor and Housing. My name is Brandon Mazur, and I'm an attorney at Perkins Thompson. This firm represents the Anchorage Inn and its owner, Ray Ramsey. We testify today in strong opposition to LB 553. This bill is legally vague and unworkable. It could re actually reduce, not expand, employment opportunities, and it is certain to damage Maine's hospitality industry, an industry that is crucial to Maine's economy. The bill only allows an employer to terminate an employee for cause, defined as reasonable basis related to an employee for termination of the employee's employment in view of relevant factors and circumstances, which may include the employee's conduct on the job or violation of the employer's policy governing employment. Under this definition, the reason for termination must be related directly to an employee. It does not anticipate other outside forces that may influence that decision by a business owner. For example, as we are all acutely aware, many main businesses needed to temporarily or permanently lay off employees due to the COVID-19 pandemic. This scenario would not be allowed under this bill. The definition of cause also does not allow the flexibility needed by the hospitality industry that often sees an increase in employment during peak tourist season. Most in hotels and restaurants cannot afford to keep a full staff 12 months out of the year. Employers must have the flexibility to adjust their workforce to respond to these changing conditions. While it's been claimed this would not be the case, that frankly isn't what the bill says. There is no definition of a planned layoff or a definition of just cause, only cause. Finally, when businesses are sold, the new owners typically lay off all employees and interview and rehire those that they wish. The bill does not allow for this practice, which can be key to revitalizing a business. The bill's proposed policy that an employer is required to use a three-step warning process before terminating an employee from misconduct would tie the employer's hand in trying to protect its guests and other employees. Again, it has been suggested that if an employer already has a discipline policy, no changes would need to be made, but the bill is very prescriptive. The bill's three-step process requires a verbal warning, then a written warning, and then a final written warning that the employee, him or herself, must first sign. The only exception to the step-by-step -step process would be if an employee has violated any state law, and there is a question who decides whether a state law has been violated, whether a court, law enforcement, or the employer. There are times when an employee's actions are so egregious that immediate termination is necessary. And if an employee makes a threat to a fellow employee or makes inappropriate or racially motivated comments, the employer should not have to wait until the employee is given warnings and stages and then agrees to sign the final warning before terminating his or her employment. Further, the employee could be held liable if it fails to take immediate action and prevent potential harm to its other employees or guests because of the employee's continued threats or other inappropriate comment, conduct while still employed during the three-step process. I see my time's running up. I do want to say that this bill in section 3702 seems to uh, supersede any other uh, provision of law where it says notwithstanding any provision contrary to law. So the supersession would apply to probation period and any other just cause issues that have been discussed previously. I thank you for your time and uh, address some other concerns in my letter that I've submitted and happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Mazur. Questions, Representative Drinkwater. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Mazur, for your testimony. I have a friend that owns an auto transport business, 20 trucks. He transport vehicles up and down the East Coast. He had a driver that uh, whose name came up for a drug test, random drug testing. He went in and tested positive for marijuana. Now, he could still had his CDL license, 
but the insurance company immediately said we will not insure him. So therefore, what choice did the employer have but to let him go? Under this bill, in your opinion, would that be just cause to fire the man? Not without the three-step process. Short, sweet answer. Thank you, sir. Are there any other questions for the committee? Seeing none, thank you, sir. Thank you. Brian Park will be next, followed by Bruce Garrity. And on deck is Kathy DeMerchant, Christine Cummings, and Curtis Picard. Mr. Now can you hear me? I can see you and hear you. Okay. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you very much. Senator Hickman, Representative Sylvester, members of the Committee on Labor and Housing. Uh, my name is Brian Park. I am the President and CEO of the Maine Motor Transport Association and a resident of Brunswick. Uh, the association is comprised of almost 1,600 member companies whose employees make up a large portion of the over 33,000 people who make their living in the trucking industry in Maine. Uh, I am submitting written comments today to testify in opposition to LD 553. Uh, and from an industry perspective, almost every single one of our trucking members are, are facing a, a dire workforce shortage that is causing a significant strain on the supply chain and the cost of goods. To be clear, this is not a complaint because we know other blue collar professions are facing the exact same challenges, but it's a reality which causes our industry and others to be flexible, inclusive, and supportive of our workforce to the greatest, greatest extent possible. Not heavy handed when it comes to using Maine's at will employment rules uh, to summarily terminate valuable employees without cause. But in our industry and likely in others that are federally regulated, sometimes there is no room for progressive discipline in order to stay in compliance with government regulations. For instance, FMCSA regulations do not allow disqualified drivers to be used Examples of this would be if a truck driver refuses a drug test, if they fail, fail to maintain their commercial driver's license, if a driver is convicted of leaving the scene of an accident, two convictions of excessive speeding, and the list goes on. We appreciate line 25 of the bill that allows for immediate termination for a violation of state law. Would encourage you to expand this to, a, 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 to uh, violating federal law as well for industries like ours that are federally regulated. However, even with this uh, recommended inclusion, we reject the notion that there's a significant problem in Maine with employers terminating employees without cause. We would further argue that making this change will only serve to add excessive process for employers to conform to and failure to do so regardless of intent will create unnecessary litigation. Most employers currently have company policies that deal with discipline and termination. Uh, and let's not forget that Maine already has laws on the books to protect employees from things like discrimination, harassment, and retaliation. I thank you for your consideration for allowing me to testify today, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have now or at the work session. Thank you, sir. Are there any questions from the committee? Mr. Brat Representative Bradstreet. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for being here. Uh, Mr. Park, good to see you. Uh, one of your members, uh, any one of your members, if they were to have an employee who was partway through the process that we're talking about here, and then uh, they did something that caused damage to somebody else in the, in the normal uh, operations of the work, uh, you know, driving and cause an accident or something while this process is going, is taking place. Would your um, uh, member or the employer conceivably be uh, liable for damages in any way, shape, or form? Oh, our, to answer your question, Representative Bradstreet, the answer is the short answer is yes. Uh, you know, to, to touch a little bit uh, upon uh, the previous question about the drug and alcohol, there are some things that are not illegal that uh, that are too important to highway safety that uh, you know to that would require immediate termination uh, without giving them three warnings. Examples of that would be. Uh, wit uh, an employer witnessing uh, distracted driving. That's not against the law because it's not enforced by, by enforcement, but that may be the company's policy that if you're witnessed one time using a handheld device, you're fired. That's too important to highway safety. 
uh, not doing a proper pre-trip trip inspection, which is which which is a require a company requirement, but not against the law if you don't do a proper pre-trip inspection that causes a, causes a crash. So, um, you know, a lot of times uh, drivers uh, drivers in particular can be disqualified um, from driving if if they are breaking an FMCSA rule, but that doesn't necessarily require them to be terminated. Um, so in this instance, it would, you know, if this law would be, in, be in effect, a lot of trucking companies would have drivers that are disqualified, so they can't use them to, to drive. Um, there, there's no requirement for them to be terminated. So they'd have to be kept on, uh, for the three-step process, even though there's no work for them to do because they're not able to drive a, a, a commercial motor vehicle. Hey, thank you. Uh, it shines some more light on the situation. Thank you. Appreciate it. So, Representative Gear. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my question, uh, Mr. Park, has to do with some of the scenarios you uh, described where an employee may have violated a company policy, but not have violated the law. For the, your member organizations, are there specific consequences laid out in their policies around what happens if you say refuse to do your inspection, that sort of thing? Um, are there already uh, written policies in existence for those companies? I, I can't speak to every single company. They have all 1,600 members of ours, but I know that most of our companies have policies. They have, and, and most of them have discipl progressive dis disciplinary pol uh, policies and procedures in place, and they utilize those all the time. The, the, uh, the objective for our members, in, in, in anyways, isn't to, to catch employees so they can fire them. Their objective is to one, comply with highway safety regulations and to make sure that the highways are safe. And two, to maintain uh, enough, of, enough of a workforce so that they can satisfy their customers. And you don't do that by just summarily terminating employees uh, you know, for, for random causes. Thank you. Are there any other questions for the com from the committee for Mr. Park? Senator Garrett. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and welcome, Mr. Park. It's so wonderful to see your face across Zoom today. Um, I had a question for you related to employment issues. Are, are your members finding uh, an abundance of people applying for jobs so that they would have the ability to be very um, choosy about who works for them or, or are they having a difficulty finding enough people to work? Well, there's two answers to that question. They have to be ultra selective in who they hire, especially to do, uh, to do truck driving jobs because it's, it's federally regulated uh, and there's too much at stake when, when it comes to highway safety. So they're very selective. But to answer your first question is we're, we're very much like every other heavy industry in the state of Maine and there's a workforce shortage uh, to the tune of, you know, we're, we're currently as an industry nationwide, we're short 100,000 drivers, uh, truck drivers in particular, which isn't to say that, uh, you know, to talk about uh, diesel technicians and warehouse staff and all that. But, you know, if I hear from a lot of our members, every time I talk to any of our members in the past six months, you know, the very first thing they talk about is, is workforce shortage. And the, 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 that if I would dare say if there were 25% more truck drivers, that were qualified, they'd, they'd be able to, to utilize uh, those drivers tomorrow. Thank you. Certainly. Any other questions from the committee? Mr. Park, you said, I believe in your testimony that you reject <clears throat> the idea that there are workers in Maine being fired without cause. Can you please tell me how you come up with that summation? I don't believe I said I reject that there is any indication uh, that that's happening. I reject that it's it's uh, it's it's a significant it, um, that it's that it's a significant uh, issue in the state of Maine. Uh, in 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 my corner of the world, you know, our empl our employers are keeping every single good. Well, they're attempting to keep every single good employee that they that they have because um, you know, they know that, that, that training and, and all of the things that they need to go through in order to fill those positions is, is, is costly. 
Um, and here's, here's my comment is that we reject the notion that there is a significant problem in Maine. So I'm not rejecting that, that, it, that it isn't a problem. I'm rejecting that it's a significant problem in Maine. And my follow-up question to that is, <clears throat> how do you know that? If you have, I mean, have you actually interviewed workers who feel that they have been fired for just cause in, across industries? I, I hire employees as an employer all the time. I, I guess I'm not sure about, about the question. I talk to, I talk to our, our members and they're, they're, in, they're, they're telling me that, that, uh, that they're not firing people without cause because if they fire people without cause, they need to replace those people uh, you know, in order to keep freight moving. I understand in your industry, because you have to be very selective that it's probably true. But I guess this bill isn't just about one industry. And so when you say you reject that there might be significant numbers of workers in Maine being fired without just cause, my eyebrows went up because I don't know how you would know that. Sure. Well, I, I, I have a brother that owns a bark mulch company. I talked to him. Uh, he has he has friends that are that are in the retail business. I talk to them. I have neighbors that that run a social service agency. I talk to them. So I, I guess I'm not sure that I, I mean, I'm, I'm not qualified to speak for all businesses, but I do have enough of a of a of a, of a, of a social network that I do talk with employers and we have 1600 member companies. They're not all trucking companies. They all have something to do with transportation, but uh, I'm not hearing that that uh, uh, you know, firing people uh, because of, of, of at will employment is 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 a significant problem. Understood. Uh, Senator Representative Warren. Uh, thank you. Just in follow up, I just to clarify, maybe to clarify, um, is is your testimony here based in that uh, a, pers um, a personal um, network, a set of experiences personal? Because I I feel that that's um, you know that would be diff that would be difficult to quantify. Um, like that's very different than uh, data or in a formal way that I f I feel I could use this part of how I analyze things more broadly. Um, but can I clarify, do you have other um, ways of evaluating this in addition? I don't want to misunderstand you. I'm not clear on what the question is. When it comes to uh, at-will employment and whether it's an issue, whether people are being fired presently uh, for that reason and how many are uh, in Maine, it seems that you're saying that in, you have a you, you've spirit, stated in your testimony, yeah. Well, in my sphere of influence, I, I, I don't see it as a problem. That doesn't mean the problem doesn't exist. Um, so maybe you should ask the, the folks that identify it as a problem to help you identify what the statistics are and quantify the problem. And, and, I, and I'm happy to, to play whatever role. I'm, I'll, I'll send out a, 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 a survey to my members if, you, if, you, if you'd like, but I'm, I'm, from my network, it, it doesn't appear to be a problem. But my network is not every single employer in, in, in every single corner of the state of Maine. So, and I'm also not willing to, to say that it, that the problem does not exist. Excellent. Thank you. That's all I wanted to clarify. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Representative Rader. I just want to make sure that um, Senator Guerin had a chance to ask her question. I've seen her hand up is. I'm that sorry. Okay? down i'll go take it down but thank you <laughs> oh okay great i <laughs> just want to make sure you got your question out thank you um senator hickman uh and following up on senator hickman's question uh you said that there wasn't a significant problem in the state of maine what numbers rise to the level of significance i'm, I'm sorry what level if it, happens, if it happens if it happens once should we pass a bill should we pass a law i i don't i don't i don't, I don't really have a a number for you um mm -hmm. you know certainly if i'm the employee that's uh that's being fired for for no reason at all i i'd put that number at one mm -hmm. you know that one is one is too many too many um but what, what what my suggestion is and i think that you know i'd speak a little bit to to the power imbalance that um that Representative Sylvester uh, indicated in his in his in his opening um, is that th th there's 
there's not as much of a power imbalance as, 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 as you, you'd think because employees ha also have the ability to leave instantly for no reason for no reason at all which which makes it hard to be an employer we just had a uh, had an employee during our busy season that got a better job and i have absolutely no problem with people bettering themselves it just came at a terrible time for me so while there's you know the employer has, has the ability to, to to fire employees currently because maine's an at-will state employees also have the ability to to leave uh, regardless of what the what the issue is on on their side of things. Uh, Senator, may I have a follow up with that? Thank you. Uh, the reason I ask for specific data is because I am hearing a lot of anecdotal evidence in general. And if we had some sort of survey of the employers who um, who would be affected by this, or the employees who affected by who would be affected by this that would really help the decision making process because if we're hearing that it's not a significant problem that is a very that is very subjective so data would help in this matter so that we're not just going off of feelings Thank well, you i guess so i guess how, what question would we ask our members have you ever fired anybody that for for no cause at all i mean i I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I, I throw it back to the proponents of the bill to, de to develop data where it is a problem. Um, I, they, they have just as much data as, as we do. Christopher, thank you. Like I said earlier in this uh, public hearing, we can engage in back and forth so long as we're asking for clarity. But I will respectfully ask anyone who makes a claim that cannot be backed up by data that that encourages the committee members to ask questions about where the claim is coming from. And so it's not like you're the only one, Mr. Park. I'm not mm -hmm. picking on you. If anyone makes a claim one way or the other in for or against this bill without data to back it up, we will ask you to bring the data. And so to say, if anyone says that this is not a significant problem in Maine, please show us the data that it's not a significant problem in Maine. And that I think is really all that we're trying to ask. Okay. I don't want to go to this point. I appreciate you being here. So if there are, are any other questions from the committee members on clarity about Mr. Park's testimony based on what's in the bill and what he has said, we will go to them. And if not, we will move on to the next person that is here to testify against the bill. Seeing none. Thank you, Mr. Park. Mr. Mr. Okay. Chair, I have my hand. I thought oh, I had I my hand raised. <laughs> no, I didn't see it. Go ahead. Okay, sorry. It was raised and it lowered somehow. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Mr. Park, again, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, I'll make a short statement. It's very difficult to prove something doesn't happen, so it's hard to find data on that. But in that regard, have you ever seen any data that indicates that this is a significant problem, something that would be demonstrable? Uh, and show that it actually did happen. These, I, have, I have, I have not seen that data, but that may not be the the circles that I run in either. To be fair, thank you. <laughs> Are there any other questions from the committee? Seeing none. Thank you, Mr. Park. Thank you. Next up will be Kathy DeMerchant, followed by Christine Cummings, followed by Curtis Picard, Dana Duran, and David Clough. Welcome. Thank you so much. One second. No problem. There. Okay. Senator Hickman, Representative Sylvester, and members of the Committee on Labor and Housing, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to share my testimony in opposition to LD 553. My name is Kathy DeMerchant. I live in Vassalboro, and I'm the president and co-owner of Capital Area and Bangor Area Staffing Solutions, Inc. I'm testifying on behalf of both the Maine Staffing Association and the Kennebec Valley Chamber of Commerce on whose board I currently sit. 
Staffing companies have a rather unique perspective regarding this issue. According to the American Staffing Association, staffing companies employed about 29,000 workers in Maine in 2019. An average of 5,700 temporary workers were employed weekly during this time. Each of these temporary workers are legally the employees of the staffing company, yet our field employees typically perform work duties at our various client company work sites. It is the client who interacts daily with our field employees, setting performance expectations and raising any concerns about the workers' activities at the client company's workplace. If there are disciplinary or performance issues with the field employees, the client company may choose to counsel the field employee on its own. They may reach out to the staffing company for assistance, which is our preference, or they may ask the staffing company to simply find a replacement temporary worker. LD 553 calls for a three-step progressive discipline process before any employee can be terminated for cause. We have several questions about how such a process would be carried out for our temporary workers. Would the staffing company or the client company or both have the responsibility for implementing the progressive discipline process? How does it work if the staffing company has the responsibility but the client company doesn't share uh, that knowledge with us? It's not uncom uncommon for the client to simply request a different temporary worker and not tell us about disciplinary problems. And if the client requests a different temporary worker and we cannot find or do not have other jobs available for the worker that was employed, does that constitute an improper termination when they let the person go? Switching to the Kennebec Valley Chamber of Commerce, which has over 545 members representing about 15,000 employees throughout the Kennebec Valley region, the majority of our members employ more than five employees and this bill would have a negative impact on their ability to do business and maintain a safe harassment free workplace. Although LD 553 creates an exception for termination due to violation of any state law, as others have noted, who determines that violation? Is it only upon arrest and or conviction? What if the employee threatens a coworker, supervisor, or consumer? What if they falsify their employment application or other documentation? And what if there are conflicts of interest, ethical concerns such as sexual harassment, racism, intolerance of sexual orientation or identification, or other egregious acts that violate the values of the employers, their employees, or their clients, or put them at risk in another manner? LD 553 is both unreasonable and impractical for the operation of business, large or small. Main businesses must remain fluid and flexible to not only adapt and meet consumer expectations, but also to protect other employees should one violate safety standards or create a hostile work environment. A three-step discipline policy is especially harmful to small, independently owned businesses and interferes with the employer-employee relationship. Mr. Merchant? Yes. Just letting you know that your time is up, if you could wrap I'm, up the next little bit. I will. Thank you. LD 553 does not make Maine attractive to companies looking to relocate to this state. In fact, only one other state has such a law, and in this time of COVID, more government mandates intruding on the business operations are simply unnecessary. And finally, there are already laws on the books which hold unscrupulous employers accountable for wrongful termination. Therefore, we respectfully ask that you vote ought not to pass on this bill. Thank you for your consideration of my testimony, and I would be more than happy to answer your questions if I can. Thank you, Mr. Merchant, for your testimony. Are there any questions from the committee? Representative Bradstreet. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Merchant, for being here. Appreciate the testimony. Uh, I'll ask you another, uh, pretty much the same question I asked a previous uh, uh, speaker, and that is, short of something illegal, uh, if, uh, one of your workers, or the workers of one of the companies that, who employ <clears throat> your services, uh, are unable to terminate someone uh, fairly quickly, <clears throat> but instead have to go through this process as proposed. Would that employee be subject to liability should something go wrong? Would the employee or the employer be subject? Is, are you asking if the, the employer is subject to liability or if the employee is subject the, to liability? The employer. Absolutely. <clears throat> okay, thank you. You're welcome. Are there any other questions from the committee? Seeing none. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Christine Cummings will be next, followed by Curtis Picard, Dana Duran, and David Clough. And as is tradition of this committee, we will return to those testifying. Uh, we will go to a person testifying neither for nor against the bill so that there is a little bit of a break in all of the testimony in opposition. Um, and then if there's anyone who has signed up to testify in favor of the bill that has not spoken already, we will return to that person and then we'll return to testimony in opposition. So unless there's objection from the committee, that's how we will proceed henceforth.
Christine Cummings. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning, Senator Hickman, Representative Sylvester, and members of the Labor and Housing Committee. My name is Christine Cummings. I'm the executive director of the Maine Grocers and Food Producers Association. Uh, we represent more than 200 businesses within Maine's food community. MGFPA is testifying in opposition to LD 553, a bill that is seeking to end at-will employment in Maine, while well, it is a laudable goal to limit an employer's ability to end an employee's employment for arbitrary and capricious reasons, LD 553 goes too far. There are significant concerns surrounding safety and liability risks. LD 553 takes away the necessary flexibility to end employment when it would be inappropriate for an employee to remain employed. Our businesses value their relationships with their staff, and in many instances, you hear from them and that they are referred to as family. By no means should retaining at-will employment be misconstrued as an opportunity for employers to act maliciously. Businesses are mindful of their termination processes and use final warnings or termination on the first offense based on the most severe misconduct in limited circumstances. Some businesses, in fact, have some of the applicable progressive disciplinary policies in place with more than the three steps required by the bill. However, they specifically reserve the right to bypass any step and proceed to another level of discipline or even directly to termination of employment in extreme circumstances, such as violence in the workplace, violations of sexual harassment and other equal opportunity policies, sexual assault, which is separate and distinct from harassment, safety violations, loss of credentials that are essential for the job, um, an example being federal DOT licensing, theft, code of, contact viola code of conduct violations, violations um, of a customer or employee privacy rights, among just a few. LD-553, um, the only exception is a violation of state law. This sole exception is simply not broad enough and does not take into consideration the other reasons that a reasonable employer might use to justify skipping steps. As a preliminary matter, there are no exemptions for violations of federal local law. Additionally, many businesses have policies and values that are valid to skip progressive disciplinary steps to move to immediate termination, none which are contemplated by 553. For example, many employers have a code of, contact, code of conduct which may be based on the law, but which may also reflect an employer's values. Um, as noted, um, LD-553 does not contemplate behavior that may not rise to the level of unlawful conduct, but which may have a significant impact on the employer's business. For example, many employers have harassment policies to set a standard higher than the law, requiring immediate termination after single use of a racial term or single sexual touching. Such conduct may not be considered severe or pervasive enough to be unlawful under state harassment laws, but certainly an employer should have the right to remove an employee whose behavior has such a ne negative impact on coworkers or third parties like customers. Accelerating the progressive disciplinary process is appropriate in such cases. Ending at will employment will eliminate the flexibility employers need to manage their staff and to ensure they're able to successfully operate, remain viable and offer, operate a safe work environment. LD-553 would make Maine the only state in the country that has been completely eliminated at will employment. And thank you for the opportunity to testify. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> I wrapped up just in time. <laughs> Are there any questions from the committee for Ms. Cummings? Seeing none, thank you for being here. Thank you. Curtis Picard, Dana Duran, David Clough. And then we will move to neither for nor against and back to testimony in favor. Good morning, Senator Hickman, Representative Sylvester, and members of the Labor and Housing Committee. I'm Curtis Picard, President and CEO of the Retail Association of Maine. I'm also a resident of Topsom. Uh, we have more than 350 members statewide and represent retailers of all sizes. Maine retailers employ more than 85,000 Mainers, and I'm here today to testify in opposition to LD-553. As drafted, LD-553 prohibits an employer from terminating the employment of an employee without cause. The bill specifies an employer may terminate an employee for cause only after applying a three-step progressive discipline policy and providing notice of termination in accordance with certain requirements. We're disappointed to see a bill like this introduced. It perpetuates a myth that the employer-employee relationship is contentious and hostile. In my 36 years of working and the last 20 years working with hundreds or perhaps thousands of businesses of all sizes, that myth could not be further from the truth. I've met so many business people who go above and beyond for their employees. When you find good employees, you work hard to keep them. 
No doubt there are some bad apples out there, but they usually don't stay in business for long because word travels. We also respectfully disagree with Rep Representative Sylvester on his interpretation that this does not apply to seasonal employees. LD 553 would drastically change the way businesses currently manage team member performance, conduct, and terminations, as well as negate the ability to utilize seasonal team members, which has been a necessary staffing model for so many retailers, including during the pandemic. And I would call your attention to the actual language of the bill and the definition of cause, which reads, cause means a reasonable basis related to an employee for termination of the employee's employment in view of relevant factors and circumstances, which may include the employee's conduct on the job or violation of the employer's policies governing employment. We had a lot of members reach out to us specifically about this issue, and our interpretation is this would not apply to seasonal employees, or that it would apply to seasonal employees. So um, I would ask that the committee take a closer look at that. The bill also takes away an employer's ability to uphold employment practices that align with their brand and established practices. Retail relies on customer service, and that often translates into appropriately high standards from a brand and culture perspective. In appropriate situations, employers may move forward with a final warning or termination for a first offense, depending on the severity of the misconduct. Customers and team members expect a retailer to live up to the brand and culture promises, and this proposed law would greatly inhibit the ability to do so in many situations. And just in wrapping up, in my written testimony, I also uh, provided the link to Pine Tree Legal's website, which we think does a very good job of explaining the legal protections currently in place to protect employees. And the last thing I'll add is that we would urge the committee to read a lot of the written testimony that's been submitted by employers today. Um, I was doing some of that last night and this morning, and we think it's helpful. So I'll stop there, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Card. Representative Drinkwater. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Picard. We heard testimony earlier from the representative of the Anchorage Inn that uh, in his uh, interpretation that uh, the COVID pandemic would not be just cause. Have you uh, given any thought to, uh, you know, what we're going through now, this pandemic and people being uh, terminated and laid off because of uh, COVID? We have, and I, that's one of the questions we have as well. Um, I'm not certain. You know, a year ago was when businesses were shut down suddenly, retailers couldn't operate, and it was actually even a number of weeks before we were even able to do curbside. Uh, so even limited operations extended for a long period. So the retail industry, hospitality, restaurants, were all forced to lay off, you know, significant numbers of people. Um, so, yeah, that's one of the questions we have, and we think the committee should take a look at that. Thank you, sir. Representative Gear. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks for being here, Mr. Picard. Um, my question, I'm just uh, curious about the, the part of your testimony that refers to um, the brand and uh, culture. And I was wondering if you could give a couple of examples so I could better understand that as to what kinds of uh, violations uh, or uh, conduct would uh, address would be a problem for brand or culture that wouldn't uh, rise to say an illegal act. But w what are you talking about there? Um, perhaps you might have a, a employee working for you that uses profanity uh, to other employees and customers. Um, you know, that could certainly rep uh, damage your reputation as a business. If you now have to use a three-step progressive policy with this person where this person is continuing to do it and not showing improvement, uh, there's a lot of work that goes into maintaining your business reputation and brand. Um, and it could easily be uh, undermined by an employee that's not you know, doing their job. Uh, follow up, Mr. Chair, if I may. You may. So um, you're saying that in a situation where, say, an employee has used profanity, they should not be allowed a three-step process and a chance to correct that behavior? I'm saying it's up to the employer to work out. And, you know, one of the things we heard from a lot of folks when we talked to about this bill is that they said 95% of the terminations that currently happen are for no-shows people that just literally don't show up to the job. So they show up, don't show up one day, you try to call them, you don't hear from them. They maybe don't show up the next day as well. I mean, what are you supposed to do as an employer in those situations? And that's what's occurring most often in the workplace. Great, thank you. 
Any other questions from the committee? Uh, Mr. Picard, this question is for you, but it's for anyone who will testify after about the relation, who represents uh, seasonal businesses that have seasonal employees. Just for my own uh, edification, can you tell me if there is some type of unspoken understanding that seasonal employees, when they have to leave a job, are not being terminated because they will come back in the next season? How is that secured between the employer and the employee, if not in a written contract? I'm just curious. Yeah, and I think a lot of folks will have um, other information as well. But for retail, you know, if you're being hired on for the holiday shopping season or now going into the spring, you're going to see the lawn and garden centers really increase their hiring. You know, it's for an a undefined but short period of time. Um, and there, a lot of those employees are people looking just for a little extra money. So perhaps it's uh, someone just wanting a little extra Christmas shopping money. You know it's a, it's a weekend gig or a night gig. You know at some point there's a likelihood it will end, but not in every case as well, because sometimes the, the, the economy is going better than you anticipate and you can hold on to more people than you think you can. Um, and then in other seasonal businesses, which are very weather dependent, you know, I'm looking outside right now and we're probably seeing an earlier than expected end to the ski season and the snowmobile season, but it could also snow again next week and extend that season as well. So employers have to have that flexibility to ramp up and ramp down accordingly. And if you have a suggestion, and I'm not saying that you do, to clarify, strengthen, correct any language in the proposal that would protect that ability for seasonal employees to, I guess, somehow be exempt from a, a disciplinary uh, hierarchy, you know, three separate things that are proposed in the bill. Would you be able to provide that to the committee before work session? We can try, but I think we're also of the mindset when you look across the country and as Representative Sylvester says, only Montana is the only state with the exception of Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands that have some form of this. Um, so I think we would have some hesitation about Maine becoming an outlier on this issue. Um, we don't see this as being a major problem. Um, so I would, I would, you know, I'm always happy to work with the committee. You know that we've always worked well together. Um, but in this case, it's it's going to be hard to find a path forward on this bill, to be honest with you. I understand that. I just wanted to, because you have a, because you represent a lot of seasonal employers, I just wanted to know if there was a way to clarify this law so that it would remove that fear that seasonal employers wouldn't be able to do what they do without cause. That's all. So thank you very much. Are there any questions from the committee? Seeing none. Dana Duran, David Clough, and then Michael Rowland from the Department of Labor will be here to testify, neither for nor against. Good afternoon. Good morning, still. <laughs> Good morning, Senator Hickman. Uh, Representative Sylvester. My name is Dana Duran. I'm the executive director of the Professional Logging Contractors of Maine. Um, we are a trade association that represents uh, timber harvesting and timber hauling contractors in the state of Maine. We have about 200 contractor members who employ about 2,500 people in the state of Maine. Timber harvesting in Maine is a $620 million component of the state economy and is responsible for 3,900 uh, direct employees in the in the industry, as well as uh, the additional uh, indirect creation of 5,400 jobs. Um, I'm here to testify in, in opposition to LD uh, 553. Um, my written testimony has been provided. I want to focus in on uh, three components uh, of it, um, because some of my other points have already been made, and I don't want to belabor the point you already heard from Mr. Park about Trucking, we have a, obviously a, an enormous uh, trucking component and, and he's uh, spoken to that. So I, wanna, I just wanna touch on three areas. Um, as you know, uh, the forest products industry has gone through a major evolution in the last decade from 2011 to 2016, we lost 2 million tons of softwood pulp cons consumption and 2 million tons of biomass consumption. Um, so we were in the midst of a comeback until uh, obviously COVID-19 uh, changed things quite a bit, but also the J explosion. And I wanna focus on that for a moment and how it pertains to this bill. 
So the digester at the J Mill exploded uh, almost a year ago. Um, and as a result of that, it has effectively led to 11,000 less truckloads of wood delivered to that J Mill um, and the reduction of 1,000 jobs in logging and trucking. This bill, because of that, would enforce a progressive discipline situation when logging and trucking companies simply do not have work. They do not have revenue. They do not have employment. Uh, they could not retain anyone. If they did, they would simply go out of business and be gone. Um, so I think we have to obviously think through those types of situations. And that is obviously pervasive, not just in our industry, but any industry who goes through some type of, of an evolution like that. Um, second, we provide, or we had the University of Southern Maine do a labor analysis for us in 2019. We need 2,000 people in our industry once markets come back, and I see my time is waning. Um, and I can tell you in rural Maine, it is not good to be heavy handed with, your, with any type of in, uh, employment policy and termination. That uh, reputation precedes you. Um, lastly, we're now entering mud season. Uh, mud season means layoffs in our industry and we are not seasonal employment. So how are we going to deal with that situation when we have to lay off people and there is no cash flow with this type of an employment, um, uh, excuse me, uh, statute? So with that, I will finish and I'd be happy to take any questions and obviously you have my written testimony. Thank you, Mr. Duran. Questions from the committee? Seeing no hands raised? Thank you, and it's good to see you, sir. Very good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. David Clough, followed by Michael Rowland, and then we'll return to testimony in favor of the bill, and that person will be Jeff McCabe. Mr. Clough, thank you. Welcome. Thank you, and good almost afternoon, Senator and members of the committee. My name is David Clough. I'm testifying on behalf of NFIB a small business group that has thousands of members here in the state of Maine. They are all small business members. I would just like to make a couple of points. I will be submitting written uh, comments, but I'd like to make a couple of verbal comments that I don't think you've heard this morning. First of all, employment at will is a two-way street. The sponsor is seeking to address one side of that equation, but there's another side that affects uh, employers quite often, particularly small employers, and that is employees who just quit uh, without advance notice, no two weeks notice, no one week notice, they just say, I quit. And the employer is left scrambling, figuring out how to take care of customers that day uh, and let alone to fill the position. But that's something that hasn't really received much attention. Second point is that while the legislation creates an exclusion for employers of one to four employees, there's still thousands of other small employers between we'll say five and 50 employees who would be affected by this. Why do I use that cutoff? Because if you do some uh, Google searching, you'll find that most small businesses do not have an on-staff HR representative until they reach a level of employment approaching 50 employees. That means then that all the additional burdens that are placed on employment of workers in a small business are burdens that have to be borne by somebody who's already wearing other hats or hats, other hat or hats in the business. Typically that's the owner or another key person in the business. Then you hear about the call for training that uh, the Department of Labor perhaps can set up some training well, that's an additional responsibility for whoever's wearing that hat in a small business. There's a progressive disciplinary process that then has to be documented. That's an additional uh, paperwork and compliance challenge for a small business owner. And ultimately, it's a question of what is the small business owner going to do given the dilemma between all the steps required by LD553 and all the responsibilities that business owner has to other employees and to customers to keep the business going and to make sure that the owner can make the payroll when the payroll comes due. Um, I will have other written comments, excuse me, I will have written comments, but I just wanted to emphasize those couple of points and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you this morning. Thank you, Mr. Clough. Question from the committee. 
Representative Cuddy. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Clough, for being here today uh, with your testimony. You mentioned um, the problem of employees leaving quickly. In your um, NFIB membership, how much notice when they're laying somebody off do they typically give? I'm sorry, please repeat the question. Your members, when they're laying someone off, how much notice do they typically give? I, I do not know that. And I don't believe that that question has ever been asked of the membership. Um, if this legislation goes forward with a majority out the pass report, for example, we will be asking small business owners to contact their legislators and explain to them uh, matters such as that and how they feel they would be affected. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none. Thank you. We will now move to testimony, neither for nor against the bill. And there is one participant signed up, Michael Rowland from the Maine Department of Labor. Good morning. I have to unmute there. Hi. Um, am I? Uh, I can hear you. I cannot see you, but we can hear you. Oh, okay. Yeah, got to start the video too. I think I'd know by now how to do this. My name is uh, Mike Rowland. Uh, greetings, Senator Hickman, the Representative Sylvester, and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Labor and Housing. I'm Mike Rowland, the Director of the Bureau of Labor Standards at the Maine Department of Labor. <clears throat> Excuse me. While the department sympathizes with the sponsor's apparent interest in promoting job security and preventing unfair termination, I'm here today to speak on behalf of the department, neither for nor against uh, LD 553, an act to end at will employment. The bill proposal would pro prohibit an employer from firing an employee without cause. Any termination would have to take place after a three-step progressive discipline policy is applied and after providing notice of termination. The proposal would limit the flexibility that many employers rely on to adjust to changes in market conditions. There's no provision for economic downturn or other unavoidable business problems. And the impact on employers and the economy during a crisis, such as a pandemic or a weather event, could be disastrous. Maine and federal laws already prohibit or restrict wrongful termination under a variety of circumstances, including protected concerted activity, whistleblower protections, protections from retaliation under some statutes, and various kinds of discrimination. Collective bargaining agreements and written or implied contracts may also partially constrain termination. The bill would put Maine out of conformity with federal law and all but one other state. Um, and to our knowledge, no other state has similar legislation pending. The only such general restriction as has been said on termination currently is the Montana Wrongful Discharge Employment Act of 1987. There at will employment is formally permitted only during a probation period and afterwards a good uh, that good cause for termination is required. However, the Montana law does allow an employer to unilaterally alter the terms of employment, including the wage and also interruption of business is a valid cause for termination. Furthermore, it is not administered by any state agency and instead relies for enforcement on civil redress through the courts. In addition, we have several concerns about implementation. Uh, the responsibility for enforcement is unclear. Um, we are uncertain how the department would fashion that required model policy and educate employers and others. Um, and some sections such as the definition uh, this, for the size of employer are somewhat unfamiliar to us and, and might prove difficult to interpret. So for any of these reasons, unless Montana enforcement is so, as in Montana enforcement is solely by private action, we anticipate there would be significant cost to the department to implement and enforce the statute. And I'll leave it at that. 
Thank you, Mr. Rowland. Are there any questions from the committee? Representative Drinkwater. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So we've heard uh, requests for data. Some of my members, you know, want data and that's understandable. So you're saying in your testimony that there are about 40,000 main employers. Mm. Can you tell this committee out of that, those 40,000 main employers, how many are bad actors? <laughs> I cannot. Um, I, Can, I uh, what I would do is, is, and this is only a partial answer, but I would refer you to our wage and hour uh, annual report to the committee so that you can, you can see at least some of the bad actors. Um, we can't do a complete account on, on that. Absolutely, and that's understandable. And if I may just have a quick follow-up, Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. After uh, hearing testimony and reading the good representative Sylvester's testimony, it seems to me that he's allowing people to be laid off, which is understandable. We have a lot of seasonal employees, et cetera. We have the J explosion of the paper mill. People were laid off. So having witnessed employers, once they have a set of rules, they adjust to these rules, wouldn't it be easier for the employers, the 40,000 employers to no longer use the term you're fired, but say you're laid off? which would allow them to collect unemployment, obviously. Mm. Uh, I wouldn't want to give an off the cuff answer to that. There are, it's a sleight of hands though, right? Is what uh, I'm talking about. There are distinctions made and ways to determine whether a layoff is turned into a, a, a permanent uh, separation in under various statutes, I think, but to, uh, to, to give a, Direct and complete answer is beyond me at the moment. All right, thank you, Mr. Rowland. It's always good to hear from you. Thank you. Representative Cuddy. Thank you, Senator. Good morning, Director Rowland. Thank you for being here this morning. Um, now this afternoon, I apologize. And we are, um, I've heard a couple of times about um, slowdowns. You mentioned the pandemic, um, different economic slowdowns in your testimony and how this bill might impact that. but the the bill um specifies termination mm -hmm. and if we are in a point where a business is not um intending to fire people they haven't done anything there's no through no fault of their own they're going to lose their job because of bad economic conditions mm -hmm. or even if you brought it to just the a single business that has seen a downturn in their business for whatever reason mm -hmm. and they want to um, get rid of people, they wouldn't fire them. They would, they would lay them off because it would be a lack of work situation. So right. can you talk about any differences? First off, can you talk about any differences uh, in how the state deals with um, uh, a lack of work layoff or some other layoff as opposed to firing a termination? Mm -hmm. I, I think it's, a, it's an excellent question. And I, and I also think that the definition of termination, if this bill goes forward, is, is going to be important both for the legislature and for us when we try to implement it. I, I would have to get back to you on where the there might be varying definitions of the term terminations, separation, layoff, uh, reduction force, those things. We'd have to, I'd have to kind of review our statutes. Um, I believe it's in there and, and I'll bring back more information. Um, but again, like, like the previous question, I, I, I can't give you an off the cuff answer that would be any good, but I'll get back to you. Fair enough, thank you. Uh, could I have a follow up to that, Senator? You may. Thank you. Um, but we do currently treat them differently. If, if somebody uh, applies for unemployment um, yep. insurance, if they were laid off and they have their layoff ticket, they're good to go. But if they are, um, if they were fired and the employer is asked, the employer says, no, I didn't lay them off, I fired them. They're not available. They can't get um, unemployment. Well, that, that, but that's also ambiguous. And, and, and that, that's within a set of statutes, the employment security statutes that I'm not familiar enough with to even begin to comment. But I know people who are in the department and, and uh, 
you know, similarly also to the question about seasonal employment, there are uh, certain industries within employment security law that are designated as seasonal and, and, uh, and we can tell you what those are too, if it's helpful to the committee. Um, so I'll, I'll bring back more information either at the work session or, or whenever is convenient um, for, um, for the committee. Thank I think you. those are excellent questions and they're questions that we'll all have to deal with if this legislation passes. So let's deal with them sooner rather than later. Representative Bradstreet. Thank you, Mr. Chan. Thank you, Mr. Rowland, again, for being here. Uh, the, uh, we, we talked a lot about data, so I'm just uh, uh, kind of make a kind of a statement that if we're relying on impartial data, the Department of Labor would be the place to go to get that. It, it would certainly be one of the places. Um, it, it's, I can't guarantee that exactly what you're asking is available, but we can try. Okay, good. Fair enough. Thank you. Yeah, let, let me add that it, the more specific and, and definite the question is uh, for data, it's always, it, you'll, you'll always get a better um, response by being specific in, in that area. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks. Representative Gear. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and nice to see you, Mr. Rowland. Uh, regarding specific data, one of the things I'm, I'm very curious about is uh, what is the percentage of Maine businesses that do not have a progressive discipline policy in writing for employees? Right. I, I think I heard you ask that question earlier of another, or somebody did, of another participant. That's cool. um, I'm guessing that we won't be able to answer it, but we'll, we'll give it a shot. Great. Thank you. And sp so just so that I'm clear, the percentage of Maine businesses that do not have a, uh, a progressive dis discipline policy. Yeah, looking for either, you know, the ones that do and, and the percent that do not. Just want to see the breakdown um, and, and, and what the population is that would potentially need this <laughs> or, and, and might not be following it currently. Okay. I'll do what I can. Are there any other questions for Mr. Rowland? My question is, is does the department keep any data on people who have been terminated and believe that they were wrongfully terminated? Specifically, probably, un 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 unless they fall into a, a, maybe a whistleblower category, if, if, and there are protections and some, most of them relate to, to, um, to uh, discrimination of, of various kinds. Probably the better source because they enforce those protections would be the Maine Human Rights Commission. Um, and, and I would suggest that, that you might contact them for more, for better information. I'll see what we can find. We probably, we, I'm certain that we have inquiries and that we advise people on, that, on those subjects, uh, the people who are terminated and want to know if they have any protections. But what records we have on actual complaints or violations, that might be difficult for us. But if, if you want to, you could ask the Maine Human Rights Commission, and, I, and I'll do the same to see if we can come up with some information together that would help. Specific to the Department of Labor, because it is my understanding that if someone feels they were wrongfully terminated because they were discriminated against, that would be the place to file that complaint. This is really just about maybe someone who feels they were wrongfully terminated because they were wearing too many rings on the job one day. Right. I don't know if the Department of Labor collects any data or keeps track of anyone who calls it up and says, what do I do about this situation that I just faced? Yeah, that's a real possibility. And it, it would it'd be in the nature of an inquiry rather than a complaint. But yes, we will, we will try to produce that information for you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, sure. Any other questions for Mr. Rowland? And of course, if we have any other questions for him after this, we can certainly submit them in writing uh, or via email. So thank you again for testifying here today, sir. Um, now we are going, I just wanna make everyone aware that we will be taking a break, a short break for lunch, not right now. Um, 
It will be after we finish more testimony in favor of the bill. And so there are a few people who have signed up to testify in favor of the bill. And unlike what I said earlier, we are going to go to Mary Beth Gagne to testify in favor of the bill, followed by Jeff McCabe. And then there's one other person whose name is blocked on my screen. So welcome. Thank you. Senator Hickman, Representative Sylvester, and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Labor and Housing. My name is Mary Beth Gagne. I'm a registered nurse, and I work for Maine Healthcare at Home, which is a home health agency in Portland. I'm also a member of the Maine State Nurses Association, the largest union in the state. I serve as member our membership as chief steward of our local union. I'm here to speak in favor of the bill. One of the foundations of our union contract is the just cause provision of our discipline and discharge procedure. This phrase, just cause, means that before an employer can discipline or discharge an employee, the employer must have good reason to do so. In other words, just cause for discipline protects us from discipline that happens just cause. Just cause a supervisor doesn't like a particular nurse or just cause a manager wants to make up a new policy without going through the proper procedures so that everyone knows and understands what the rules are. Because I have just cause protections through my union contract, I am not an employee at will, meaning my employer may not fire me at any time or for any reason. And that means there are no barriers or obstructions for me for advocating for my patients as aggressively as I can. Even when my clinical judgment respect my opinion, uh, even when my clinical ju judgment conflicts with that of my supervisor or manager. My employer must respect my opinions and my recommendations, even if my employer thinks differently than I do. As a nurse who cares for pediatric patients, Far away from the medically controlled environment of an acute care hospital, my clinical judgment and my skills as an advocate are the most important tools I have to protect the children for whom I care. While just cause it is an important tool for me and the other 2,000 other nurses who are not in a union and who do not have, but the other 2,000 nurses in our union across the state of Maine, what about all the other nurses who are not in a union? and do not have that protection. How can they be sure that they will not be disciplined or discharged for fiercely advocating for the best interest of their patients? In truth, they cannot. Non-union nurses must rely at all times on discharge of the goodwill of their employer that they will not be disciplined or discharged for aggressively advocating for the best interests of their patients. And We have, can you hear me? You went on mute, Mary Beth. There we go. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, we must empower and trust direct caregivers across the state to use their best clinical judgment at all times without the fear of unjust discipline and discharge. We must eliminate at-will employment in the state of Maine for healthcare workers and for all workers. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions? Representative Bradstreet. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for being here. I appreciate all the work that you do. Uh, do you have any figures or statistics to show where nurses who maybe are not in your organization have been uh, wrongfully terminated? I, I do not. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from the committee? Representative Gear. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you for being here. Um, my question is, what is the process by which a, say a visiting nurse, like in your, in your situation out in the home, in a home care setting, um, what is the process that you are to follow when there is a um, disagreement, perhaps say on the care of a patient? Um, 
well, if, if, a, if a nurse is, or another clinician, we have therapists and uh, social workers as well. If they are called into their supervisor's office, they would have um, a steward, myself, or one of the stewards attend with them. Um, you know, the case is reviewed, uh, there may be a course of action, um, and it may be the three-step process, or things may not be written up, and um, just education could be provided to that nurse. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you for being here today. Thank you. We have two more people testify <clears throat> before we take a break. Uh, Jeff McCabe and Jeff Young. Welcome, Mr. McCabe. It is afternoon. Good afternoon, Senator Hickman, Representative Sylvester, members of the Committee on Labor and Housing. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say congratulations to uh, my former colleague and, and my friend, Senator Hickman. It's, it's great to see you chairing the Labor Committee. Really excited for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Jeff McCabe. I am the Director of Legislation and Politics for the Maine Service Employees Association. Uh, we represent uh, approximately 13,000 workers and retirees, uh, mainly in the public sector statewide. And I'm here today in support of LD553. Uh, you should have received our written comments, so I will stray from those a little bit uh, to talk about some of the questions that I've heard today and to respond to those. But I wanted folks to, uh, to think about this moment that we're in Throughout our great state, Maine workers consistently show up for work every day, uh, mainly doing you know, work that puts them at great risk, injury, and death. This is especially true more and more during this current pandemic. Let's all consider for the moment the unfathomable loss of life and suffering during the COVID-19 pandemic. It is causing workers and their families across our great state and nation and all around the world and underlying racial inequities this pandemic has laid bare with low wage workers, people of color and workers and jobs already marginalized disproportionately and harmed. Yet most of these essential workers have carried out duties for all of us. They continue to carry us throughout this pandemic, the janitors, the grocery store workers, the childcare workers, the retail workers, the restaurant workers, the manufacturing workers, to name just a few, are at will employees under Maine law. Being an at will employee means that you can be fired for no reason. So let's think about this. On the one hand, you're a hero as an essential worker, but at the same time, you can be fired without even being given a reason. That's not the way heroes should be treated, and that's not the way we should treat essential workers and how they should be treated in the state of Maine. This pandemic has confirmed much of what we have already known, that most essential workers, often the most underpaid, lack affordable health care, and effects of all of this, regardless of whether or not they have insurance. A worker's safety protection and the agencies that enforce them are broken. The safety net in our state and our nation is in desperate need of reform. I've heard this committee ask several times for data from uh, different business organizations, uh, confirming that they couldn't provide data today. I've also heard you ask for data from the Department of Labor, who also couldn't provide data um, they may be able to provide some piecemeal, but I want you to think about things during this pandemic. It seems to me the only mechanism that workers have to complain is through collective bargaining agreements in organizations such as ours, uh, advocacy groups for those workers. But at the same time, I'm not aware of many opportunities that people have to actually file complaints uh, anonymously or really reach out to the Department of Labor and get the support that they need during this, this um, current pandemic. I think also uh, one of the mechanisms for reporting individual businesses during this pandemic has really only been done through uh, the Department of Economic and Community Development. Mr. And that's McCabe, a process. Yep. I just have to let you know your three minutes are up if you could wrap up shortly. Fantastic, thank you, Representative. So, uh, you know, it might be helpful for the committee to ask for that data on those uh, violations in reports that have been reported to DECD, just as a way to track complaints that have come up uh, during the pandemic. I'm happy to take any questions and I look forward to the work session. Thank you, Mr. McCabe. Are there any questions? This is Representative Bradstreet. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Mr. McCabe. You probably expected a question from me. Huh? 
Uh, despite the uh, spottiness of data that does exist, do you have any, at least anecdotal uh, instances of where people think they've been wrongfully terminated, terminated that's, as I mentioned, fairly recently, because as I recall, uh, last session we had a similar bill and one person who testified uh, that he'd been wrongfully terminated, it turns out that he, that happened in 1956. I just wondered if you have something much more recent. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that question. I can definitely work on getting some. Uh, we have folks that, uh, you know, we, we end up dealing with folks that, uh, you know, that are, that are covered under our collective bargaining agreements who, you know, feel that they've been wrongly uh, terminated. Uh, and through that process, you know, often receive a restoration of their job. Um, you'll hear a bill shortly in regards to folks that are in their probational period, uh, sort of separate from this, but we'll have some examples for that. And I might be able to bring them in for this discussion. Uh, and then we might have to cast the net wider and see if there are folks listening today um, or other advocacy groups that might be able to help with that question. So appreciate that question, Representative. And it's, it's always good to see you and, and get a question from you as well. Okay, I didn't want to disappoint you. <laughs> Any other questions from the committee for Mr. McCabe? Representative Warren. Thank you so much. Uh, there was, there's been a couple of uh, people have testified who brought up a point that I'd be interested in your view on if you have any thoughts as they're relevant to your testimony and expertise uh, having to do with um, being one of the first states maybe to engage with some of these types of um, regulation or um, you know work protections. Um, I'm thinking about, for example, a change a, a relative to a conversation around um, uh, raising the minimum wage and how maybe at the federal level things are going to shift in a certain way. And it seems that uh, Maine, you know, is what did come before, um, you know, the, the country. And um, it seems like it's been a very, um, it seems like at least data that I've seen seems it's been a positive or has led to other, in a positive way, has led to certain things. But um, but it did come before. So there's, I, I'm just wondering how do you um, understand those trade-offs, whether it's just something we, that should be first or more first on. Absolutely, thank you representative for the question. And, um, you know, I would agree that, uh, you know, during those discussions around, uh, you know, raising of, of minimum wage, there, there was some concerns raised. Uh, I, I think the statistical data and such has, has proven that, uh, you know, the, the great deal of benefits. We have seen benefits uh, for the folks that we represent in raising wages uh, within, um, you know, our lower wage workers. We have even seen within the uh, state executive branch contract and elsewhere that workers are now being hired in at, um, you know, I, I, I believe, uh, you know, higher step, step two, step three, based on, on that wage piece. Um, you know, and I, I think overall, we still have uh, low wage workers within, uh, you know, state government and elsewhere. So that's something that we need to continue to work on. Um, I, there was a number of questions that were raised uh, by representatives of the business community um, that I, I think during the work session probably could be addressed. Um, you know, as, as it relates to sort of what progressive discipline would mean for those, uh, you know, those businesses, as well as concerns, um, you know, there was concerns raised around legality and, uh, you know, people who, who may or may not have committed a crime in the process around that. So I, I think that those, a lot of those things can probably be worked out uh, in the discussions in the work session and just more or less clarified um, in I wrote down some notes and we'll, we'll definitely provide some clarifying information both to the committee, but also, uh, you know, for the work sessions as well. So, yeah, I think, you know, and, and I will say sometimes these um, public hearings, you know, I, I think uh, our emotions can get, uh, you know, raised, we can get excited and become passionate, but it's also important to recognize that during these public hearings, um, you know, different organizations bring forward concerns um, and that's the purpose of the work session to try to figure those out and, and figure out where their common ground is. So thank you for the question, Representative. Any other questions for Mr. McCabe from the committee? Seeing none, we will take um, the final person testifying in favor of the bill before our break. That would be Mr. Jeffrey Young. 
And I will say to anyone who is left to testify in opposition to the bill, we will return at one o'clock for the rest of the testimony so people can prepare uh, for that, okay? So Mr. Young, there you are. Welcome, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Senator Hickman, Representative Sylvester, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. If I'm repeating something, I apologize, but I was in a court hearing and wasn't able to join until late into the session. Um, I'm an attorney. I work as a labor and employment lawyer. I'm a member of the Maine Employment Lawyers Association, which has about 75 attorneys here in Maine. We're the ones that feel the cause from employees who feel that they've been wrongfully discharged. And I can tell you that we probably in the aggregate get you know, over a hundred calls a year. I'll try to get some data from my members um, for the committee hearing. I also am a union attorney and I've been practicing in that regard for about 30 years. And even with just cause provisions similar to those in progressive discipline policies and unionized workplaces, I can probably tell you that over my 35 years, I've arbitrated cases that have resulted in the reinstatement of 50 to 100 employees. So one to two employees a year. I've also certainly lost my share because beauty is eye in the, in the eye of the beholder about whether somebody was justifiably discharged. What I really want to say here this morning, though, is I think it's a myth that Montana is the only state to have abolished at-will employment. It's the only state to have done so statutorily, but um, many states have abolished the at-will doctrine, particularly with regard to employment handbooks, where they say that an employer has to follow the employment handbook. And there is an opinion from a very respected judge here from Maine, Judge Kermit Lopez, some 25 years ago in Taliento versus Portland West Neighborhood Planning, in which consul, in which Justice Lopez, in a footnote, cited the 38 jurisdictions and cases involving employment handbooks in which the at-will doctrine had been rejected. So it's simply wrong to say that at will is the rule all across the country, at least with respect to handbooks. There are other states that have adopted other exceptions to the at will doctrine, including good faith exceptions and whistleblowing and that. Um, what I commonly get from employees when they call and say that they've been wrongfully terminated is that uh, it's in my handbook and it's unfair, I wasn't treated right. And my response today is the same as it was before Justice Lopez's dissent. The handbook is not worth the piece of paper it's written on. Unless you're represented by a union or have a contract of employment, regardless of what the handbook says, you can be fired for good reason, no reason, or bad reason. I think it's time to revisit the at-will doctrine um, I will, like I said, provide some data for the committee, but um, I don't disagree with what I've heard from some of the employer representatives that the bill needs to be tweaked. There are occasions, there are bad actor employees. If you could just wrap up, please. I will. There are, so I think the bill needs to be tweaked, but Neela supports the concept is what I want to say. Thank you for your time. Well, thank you, Mr. Young, for your testimony. Representative Brinkwater has a question for you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Young. You always bring a lot of experience to these type of discussions. As we witnessed with Obamacare that uh, certain promises were made, and then when the law went into effect, the insurance company changed the rules because they can do that. My concern with this is, and I'd like to have you uh, briefly talk about it, is what we're talking about is laid off versus fired. Wouldn't it be very easy for the employers to say, you know what, it's a sleight of hands. Let's just say, hey, guess what? We're not firing you. We're just laying you off. Now, obviously, that opens up the whole unemployment uh, avenue. So how would we prevent that from happening? 
Thank you for the question. And I always appreciate your thoughtfulness, Representative Drinkwater. I think that is a good question. And in fact, a lot of times people refer to employees who have been terminated as laid off. And I resist that kind of distinction. The difference is that you're laid off, I think, is that at least off, there's an expectation of a return to work. And so I think the way that that would be handled is to say, if an employer tries to say that someone's laid off, is to ask the employer, is there an expectation that this employee is going to be recalled to work? And if he or she isn't recalled within a certain period of time, then it's probably reasonable at that point to say that the employee actually has been terminated and has not been laid off. And then the employee could invoke his or her rights as to whether they in fact were properly terminated. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Representative Bradstreet. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Young, for being here. Uh, you, uh, I guess you do work for a lot of unions. Is your particular, uh, evidently you have a, a law practice, so uh, is your law practice a unionized uh, place of employment? And uh, um, how do you, excuse me? Sorry, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Go ahead, Representative Bradstreet. Okay, I'm just wondering how you uh, would approach somebody uh, you think needs to be terminated maybe sooner rather than later in case you ever run across that. As a matter of fact, I have. Right now I'm a solo practitioner, Representative Bradstreet, so I only work for myself. But um, for 26 years, I was an employee at the law firm of McTague Higby, which represents or did represent unions. And in fact, the employees there are members of the machinist union and enjoy the protections of a union contract. And, um, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say that all is lovey-dovey all of the time, but, you know, we work through those problems and the employees there have, have the protections that I think other employees uh, across our state ought to have. I hope that answered your question, Representative Bradstreet. Okay, you. I guess uh, then you, you were a sole practitioner, you don't ever run into the problem where you maybe have to terminate someone. I, I, uh, I to be certain, I did have that issue or dis at least disciplinary issues when I was with my former firm. Okay, that's that's fine. Thank you. Are there any other from Mr. Young at this time? Seeing none. We will take a break for lunch. The Joint Standing Committee on Labor and Housing will be at ease and we will return to hear more testimony against LD 553 beginning at one o'clock. See you soon.
Alyssa, are we able to go live? Are we live? Yep, the stream continues while we're on break. Perfect. <laughs> it is three minutes after one o'clock in the afternoon. We will return to the Joint Standing <phone rings> Committee on Labor and Housing, the public hearing on LD 553, an act in at will employment in Maine. Sponsored by Representative Michael uh, Sylvester is in front of us today. We have, just so that everybody knows who's listening in, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I think if I can count correctly, 15 people left in the queue to testify. We are now taking testimony in opposition to LD 553. And so everyone knows where they are in the queue. If they can't see it, we will have Don Flannery, Greg Dougal, Jane Gen Marvin, and Jeff Austin will be our first four testifiers. And uh, we will announce those that are on deck as we go along. Representative Sarah Pepworth is still going to keep the clock. Please restrict your Testimony to three minutes. There will be more time for questions and you can add more to your testimony at that point. So with that, welcome back everyone. I hope you had a good lunch. I took too long to cook mine and I haven't eaten yet, but um, I'm <laughs> I'll nibble between testifiers and um, we will start with Mr. Don Flannery if he's ready. Yes, I see you. Welcome, good afternoon. Oh. Welcome, Represent or Senator Hickman, Representative Sylvester. I'm Don Flannery, the Executive Director of the Maine Potato Board, and to speak in opposition to LD uh, 553. You caught me a little short too, Senator. I was just finishing up something uh, that I was had in my mouth. So, uh, excuse me. Uh, uh, you've heard a lot of testimony today, and I won't keep you uh, long. I think I wanted to bring two things to the committee's attention as it relates to agriculture, in particular our case, but maybe other agriculture in the state. And one is the uh, maybe, well, so, uh, Representative Sylvester offered uh, in, the, in the original bill, the DOL would put together a template and provide that to employers. I still think there's some burdens, some uh, concerns there as it relates to small employers. Most large employers are going to have this process in place, no doubt about it. But I think someone in our case, like in agriculture, that may have a few employees, maybe five employees, there's also a burdensome part of that, even if you've got a template to work with. So that's a concern. But our bigger concern uh, about this, and you've heard about seasonal uh, in previous testimony today, but our seasonal, I think, is a little more bit unique in that our seasonal uh, is maybe two weeks in the spring and three to four weeks, depending on the weather in the fall. And that becomes a bit of a challenge uh, in, in doing that because you've got very small windows. These aren't long seasonal positions or short ones. And I think the best way to explain it, and uh, as I looked at it, is give you an example. Uh, let's look at harvest where you may harvest if the weather's good for uh, three weeks, so maybe 18 days. And you have an employee that comes uh, to work the first two days, doesn't show up on the third day. He comes, so he comes back on the fourth day, you talk to him and you go through that process. That's good for a couple of days. He doesn't show up on the sixth day. Well, after the sixth day, you go through that process yet again. And he's pretty good maybe until the 18th day and, uh, or the 17th day, depending how you want to look at this. So that's the third time that he doesn't show up. So you talk to him again, you still got four days of harvest left and you can't let him go until it happens on the, the fourth time. And then you can dismiss him. Well, you're through the season in our case, but also you've lost an employee for three days in a very short window that you don't have. And it puts a, it kind of ties our hands because normal course of business, if the guy doesn't show up one day, you may give him a chance to show back or come back to work. But when he does it the second day, you're going to, you just can't, you got to fill the position. You got to have somebody else come and do it. So I think as you work this bill, uh, and I'll gladly answer any questions today or during the work session, but I think when you look at seasonal, you have to look at seasonal as it relates to different industries and, uh, and, and agriculture is one that uh, I think is really unique and that this bill would need to be uh, kind of finessed uh, not to put a hardship on our industry. So I thank you for your time and I won't keep you any longer because I know you got a few more people behind me. Thank you, Mr. Flannery. And good to see you. <laughs> I see you minutes from time to time as well. So there you have it. Are there any questions? From the committee. 
Thank you. Thank you. Greg Dugo. Welcome. Thank you, Senator Hickman. Um, and you, my name is Greg Dougal, and I'm here speaking on behalf of Hospitality Maine and our over 1,000 restaurant and lodging members in opposition to LD 553 and Act and at Will Employment. Uh, I will also try to be brief because I know you've been at this uh, for quite some time already. Um, but uh, I would like to reiterate the fact that uh, Montana is the only state in the U.S. that is completely, completely not at will. All other states in the U.S. have some version of at will employment. Uh, this proposed statute would make us completely not at will. Um, again, I don't want to belabor the point, but the hospitality industry has obviously been through some hardships. Uh, continuously adding new things that they need to accomplish is not helpful. I have three points I would like to make. Uh, re regardless of what Representative Sylvester says, the way this bill is written would make it very difficult for a seasonal property that has outside dining areas that are closed after the fall season from ever laying anyone off. A person who is part of a reduction in workforce could always claim they were terminated illegally because it happened without the three-step process described in the proposed legislation based on the fact that she or he was selected for that layoff and not someone else. Is layoff a just cause? Not according to the definition that was provided. It will be something the courts will sort out for years and there is no precedence for this law as it is written here in this country, potentially provoking the right to private action that seems that Representative Sylvester said seems to be somewhat limited. Uh, I would argue that point. Also, we have tremendous concerns about the way the egregious violations by an employer handled in the proposed statute. Violations of statute are not always easy to define, especially if law enforcement is not involved. It could put the onus on the employer to defend themselves after enforcing on their own the very laws and regulations that may have been promulgated by this committee and the legislature. Most of these issues are handled by the employer and not a police officer. Most hospitality business owners don't have law degrees. Consuming alcohol or drugs on property or before arriving to work, verbally harassing an employee or supervisor, being extremely rude to a customer, not showing up to work without notice may not rise to the level of illegal activity, but can certainly rise to a level more onerous than being late to work a few times. Not only can we not terminate anyone based on these issues, but we have to give them three more chances to repeat the same or similar violation. Seems odd that the employee has to go through this process when the employee can quit without notice at any time. So I thank you very much for listening to me and I think I beat the clock, Representative Hebworth, uh, and you all have a wonderful day. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Dugo. Any questions? Seeing none. Thank you. You're welcome. You're thank, welcome. You. thank you. Thank uh, you. Gene Marvin will be next. Jeff Austin will follow. And Jessica the Liberty is on deck followed by Josh Tardy. Welcome. Good afternoon, thank you so much. Um, Senator Hickman, Representative Sylvester, and members of the Labor and Housing Committee. My name is Jean Marvin. I reside in Scarborough, and I'm here to testify in strong opposition to LD 553 and Act to End at Will Employment. I'm employed as the innkeeper at the Nonantum Resort in Kennebunkport. We are a seaside resort established in 1884 and owned by 10 members of my family. We have 109 rooms and four food outlets and on a seasonal basis employ up to 200 workers. On a year round basis, there are about 16 of us, meaning that seasonal layoffs are a way of life for us. LD553 would completely decimate a business that I've spent the past 23 years building. We pride ourselves on expecting a lot from our team and they in turn expect a lot from us. One of the foundations of who we are as an organization and as a main base family is that we are a work family. We take care of each other. LD553 would allow members of the Nonantum family to do less than their best and still be allowed to be part of our team. This flies in the face of our values as an organization. And I wanna give you an example that happened one night. In our kitchen, a waitress put an order in 
And when she brought the food out, the people said, oh, that wasn't what I ordered. And she realized she keyed it in correctly. And so she went back to the chef and handed him the plate back and said, I'm so sorry, I put the wrong order in. Can you please remake this to Dada? And he said some very unkind words to her and threw the plate at her. What happened was our chef immediately brought him into his office, talked to him, and at that time he was terminated because there's no place in the Nonantum Resort for that kind of behavior. As a business, we should be allowed to take immediate action when inappropriate behavior takes place. Our team and guests certainly deserve this respect and this level of safety. Should government really be allowed to tell me who I can and can't have as a member of my team regardless of their behavior? I think not. My family and I take financial risk each and every day. Why should someone in Augusta decide who, how we're going to run our business? I would like to tell you that following a three-step warning discipline uh, policy would result in meaningful conversations and respectful um, signing of dialogue, but my experience is that is not the case. Most people are informed they're being, when they're informed they're being terminated, they storm out. The idea of getting them to sign a document is just not workable. And I wanna tell you in 23 years, I've maybe fired 20 people and almost all of them is because they didn't show up to work. There, I mean, it really doesn't happen. So I know I'm short on time. And so I'm going to tell you there's an unbelievable shortage of workers in this state. We treat our workers like gold because we have to and because it's the right thing to do. And so um, I wanna thank you for the opportunity for, to speak on this and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Ms. Marvin. Are there any questions? Representative Bradstreet. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Ms. Marvin, for being here. I'm just, just gonna ask you a straightforward question. <clears throat> How could you enter someone into a, a process uh, called for in this particular bill if they're not even there because they don't show up? Yeah, that, I think that would be challenging. Okay, so maybe even if it passed, it might not, in your estimation, it wouldn't be workable anyway because they usually don't stick around for I really don't think it's workable at all. I mean, if the person doesn't come to work, they're obviously not going to come in to sign something that makes them be terminated. So I just think that that just really is completely unworkable. Okay. Thank you. And Representative Bradstreet, I just want to say that your, um, your streaming is off. So if you ask another question, you may want to turn off your video. We will be at least able to hear you until we can get the problem corrected. It's probably a what I call a waffling issue. <laughs> it could be. I've waffled a few times. I've actually been in the cross building, so it should be good, but it's not. Thank you. I'll, I will uh, stop my video then. Yeah, I just know that you're here and it's perfectly fine for you to ask a question if you can't show up. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for Ms. Marvin from the committee? Thing none. Good to see Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. Jeff Austin will be next, followed by Jessica LaLiberty, Josh Tardy, and then Josh Tweedy. I am here. Can you see me? Yes. Welcome. Yes. See and here. Thank Both you, Senator, Hick Senator Hickman, members of the committee. My name is Jeff Austin. I am here on behalf of the Maine Hospital Association to testify in opposition to the bill. Uh, you've been at it a long time. In summary, I think our testimony is probably closest to Brian Parks from the truckers in that there are a number of issues that our members have concerns with that fall short of um, violations of law, but that are important safety protocols inside the hospital. And while some uh, violations of those protocols are mistakes and, you know, one warning, two warning systems are appropriate. Others they're concerned about um, are not and should be grounds for either immediate dismissal or, you know, one strike, one sort of warning. Um, but it's typically rooted um, in patient safety and you want to make sure that you're doing everything you can to make sure, you know, what could be catastrophic catastrophic mistakes, uh, patient harm don't occur. So uh, I think most of our employers are so big that they have, you know, broadly speaking, progressive um, discipline policies. I don't know that they're all consistent 
uh, as required by this bill with a, a three or four strike system laid out. So for those reasons, we would ask you not to uh, upend the system we have in place today and to reject the bill. With that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Austin. Are there any questions from the committee? Seeing none. Thank you. Good afternoon. Alyssa, who is next? I think you are telling me that one of our testifiers is not here. So let's go to the list. Uh, we have Josh Tardy next. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. There he is. Welcome. Good afternoon. Good thank afternoon. you, Senator, Senator Hickman, uh, Representative Sylvester, and distinguished committee members. I'm Josh Tardy. I'm a resident of Newport. I'm a lobbyist for Mitchell Tardy Jackson. And again today, I'm, I'm presenting testimony for Allison Susi, the Chief Operating Officer and Director of Government Affairs at the Maine Tourism Association. Uh, the association is the state's largest advocate for tourism-related businesses. Uh, includes lodging, restaurants, camps, campgrounds, retail, outdoor recreation, uh, amusements, uh, and, and, a, and a range of other businesses. And, and to be clear, the association opposes LD 553, and uh, it opposes on broad grounds. But I, I want to be responsive to, to Senator Merrimont and his request that those who testify uh, provide uh, specific and sort of constructive points. And I, and I certainly appreciate uh, the bill sponsor, Representative Sylvester's acknowledgement of the issue on seasonal employment. And that's really where I want to focus my comments today, Mr. Chair. Uh, the tourism industry views the, the bill as unworkable uh, in that it, it doesn't consider, at least as drafted, the seasonal nature of, of our tourism sector. Uh, and many of our members will not be able to uh, likely fall into the 20 week exception. And we have. Uh, uh, issues with how this bill uh, and, and it's how, how it would be practically implemented as, as we deal with uh, uh, progressive discipline for seasonal employees. Uh, we also have uh, concerns about the intermittent and uh, economic unexpected downturns uh, that, that our sector is, those factors such as weather, the factors such as gas prices, rising gas prices, factors such as a pandemic, uh, which every sector has to deal with, but tourism in, for sure is, is, is in the crosshairs of, of the pandemic. Uh, we're worried about uh, how economic factors play into the definition of for cause. It's in section 3702. And, uh, and, and we're also worried about, as uh, many speakers have talked about, the uh, violations or, or those acts of uh, misconduct or those that an employer thinks are detrimental to the mission of, of, of the business that fall short of state law. And we're worried about the ability of the employer to protect other employees, to protect patrons, and, uh, and really uh, to just summarize, Mr. Chair, and committee members, that uh, I appreciate the administration's position as expressed through the Department of Labor. I think that the Department of Labor uh, sort of sort of expressed all the talking points that were on my checklist. And for those reasons, I would I would request that the committee vote this out as ought not to pass, but certainly would be willing on behalf of the association to answer questions and to provide uh, data that we can uh, ret retrieve. So with that, Mr. Chair, I'm, I'll conclude. Thank you, Mr. Tardy. Are there any questions from the committee? Representative Bradstreet. Thank you, I'll, I'll try to answer, ask a question. Thank you, Mr. Tardy, for being here. Uh, you, you mentioned briefly about all the, I guess we call them carve out situations where this wouldn't apply. Is there any way you could ever uh, conceivably uh, come up with a list of everything that might happen like this pandemic? Nobody would have guessed this a little over a year ago. It might not have been in there yet. It probably should be covered if this bill would, would go through. Uh, is there any way of predicting what we can't see? Uh, it, it's we'd, we'd be we'd be pretty good in the stock market if we could make those type of predictions. But I, I agree with the premise of your question, Representative. And, and no, I mean it, it's it's tough for 
legislation to contemplate every hypothetical situation. Uh, uh, and in this particular case, uh, you know, I agree with the premise of your question. Thank you. Any other questions from the committee? Seeing none, we will move on to Jessica Lelewicki. Uh, we had an error. I will take responsibility for that. My apologies. There you are. Thank you. Good afternoon, Senator Hickman, Representative Sylvester, and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Labor and Housing. My name is Jessica Liberty. I'm the Policy Relations Manager for the Manufacturers Association of Maine. We are a nonpartisan, pro-growth, pro-manufacturing industry organization representing 400 members and the 29,000 workers they employ. We are here in strong opposition of LD553, an act to end at will employment. This proposal gives us great pause. I will just go over the highlights of our testimony. You have written testimony in front of you. As written, an employee who has behaved inappropriately toward another, sexual harassment, physical or sexual violence, stalking, would have to be given three notices before being dismissed. This bill ties the hands of employers. What about their need and desire to maintain a safe, non-threatening work environment? How is an employer to keep all workers safe? This bill would eliminate a business's right to have a zero tolerance policy. While there is an attempt to include a provision that an employer may terminate for behavior in violation of state law, what that means is unclear. Does a court have to find a violation has occurred? If a business believes a violation has occurred, but they are incorrect, is that termination in violation of the law? or taking bad behavior out of the equation in an economic downturn, a manufacturer would be unable to resize its workforce. LD 553 is yet another attempt to further regulate private business. An employee could be robbing the company blind, yet have to be given multiple chances to correct their behavior. What about egregious safety violations? Many of our members work with chemicals, gases, and heavy equipment and have very stringent safety rules. Any violation of these cardinal safety rules that could lead to injury to themselves or to another employee would be a case for automatic dismissal, but under this bill, it would require three notifications. What about a hostile work environment, conflicts of interest, working for a competitor at the same time, insider training, we've heard about the job abandonment, time card fraud, accepting or facilitating bribes. We again find ourselves asking the question how this bill aligns with the objectives outlined in the governor's economic plan. How, if passed, would this bill help to provide a stable business environment or attract new companies to come to our state? This proposal is bad for business and it's bad for the state of Maine. Businesses should be allowed to set their own standards of conduct. We have a duty to protect our employees and keep them safe on the job. And we have a right to protect our investments and our assets. We've heard from many members who are extremely concerned about this bill. One said that it would have a chilling effect on hiring. And another noted that they had a scenario just last month that it would set us up to have resources continue to be drained assessing poor performance because we would be required to go through a three-step process, giving the employee sufficient time to demonstrate progress between steps all the while knowing that the employee is not a fit. As a small company with very limited capacity, this would be devastating. We're barely surviving right now and we cannot afford to waste time on issues that are not productive. For this and many reasons, the Manufacturers Association of Maine opposes LD 553 and we urge a not not to pass vote. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Liberty. Are there any questions? And again, I apologize, we, the name and- <laughs> No problem. You and now we are, but it's all good. You're here it's and, you and our, it doesn't look like the committee has any questions. Thank so thank you. Tony and see you again. Alyssa, who is next? Next we have Larry Grondon. Welcome, Mr. Grandin. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for having me here today. My name is uh, Senator Hickman, Representative Sylvester, and members of the uh, Committee of Labor and Housing. Uh, my name is Larry Grandin. I'm the owner of uh, one of the owners of RJ Grandin Sons, based in Gorham, Maine. I live in Scarborough. I'm here uh, representing the Associated Builders of 
in, of Contractors of Maine. Uh, thanks for having me today. Um, I will paraphrase my uh, written testimony, which has been submitted, um, as there is much overlap with many of the members. Um, but I would like to oppose LD 553 as um, presented. It would place unreasonable burden on small businesses across the state, but also make Maine an outlier in regard to employment law across the entire country. And I don't think this is a distinction that, that Maine wants. Um, I would like to just focus on comments from uh, Brian Park, Jeff, Miss Little Liberty that just spoke, all safety sensitive issues. Um, you know, our company um, is, uh, you know, very safety oriented. We, we, you know, we work with heavy equipment. Um, so there's been points in time where, you know, you know, if it's a minor safety infraction, sure. Yeah, you, you, you talk with them and, and, you know, do some more training. Um, but we've had major infractions, um, just, just totally disregard um, putting people at risk. And there's zero, there's zero room for that. Um, uh, so this, I think this would, would, would um, be hindrance on that. Um, the Department of Labor spoke and said there's many other avenues uh, to do similar things. Um, so um, I think it's redundant. Um, Mr. Clough earlier said, you know, it, you know, we're looking at a two-way street. That's a two-way street as far as employment, either way. And this is only addressing one of them, um, you know, because an employee can just walk off, um, and that happens. Unfortunately, that happens. Um, so just, um, you know, employers don't relish terminate employees. Um, Anyone who's had to be in a, the business end of termination know it's, it's uncomfortable for everyone involved. Many times employers uh, have poured tons of resources and time and money into training employees, whether it's field staff, office staff, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so letting them go means letting go of that investment. So it's not done lightly. Um, however, there are times that it's necessary to part ways quickly. Um, so for many reasons on behalf of ABC Maine uh, and the members we represent, and we'd, we'd like to um, uh, you to vote ought not to pass on LD 553. Any questions? Thank you, sir. Let's get to questions. I see Representative Drinkwater. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And you, you've brought up some very interesting points that it's a two-way street and that you invest a lot of money into training employees to get them to where they're proficient and good at their job. So would you recommend that if this bill was to go forward, perhaps there should be a amendment added that once you've invested X number of hours and dollars into employee, they cannot leave for X number of weeks, months, or years? Um. Well, honestly, I don't see that ever happening. Um, I honestly see this bill, personally speaking, from um, my company's perspective, just not workable. Very similar to how Jean Gimarvin, uh, her testimony. Um, we, we pride ourselves on the way uh, we, we treat our employees, uh, but also our customers outside, uh, even just passer buyers of any of our job. Uh, job um, and you know, we expect our, our employees to, to uphold that same level of respect to employees as well as the general public. Um, so um, to answer your question, I, 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 I don't see that passing. So my point is this, you invest tens of thousands of dollars into improving proficiency in employees and, and you're taking a chance and you'll give them every chance to correct a minor infraction because you've invested too much money to let these people just go somewhere else. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Are there any other questions? Representative Gear, did I see your hand? Yes, yes thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank, thank you, Mr. Grondon, uh, for being here today. Um, two questions for you. One is, so in, in your company, when an employee joins, uh, those kinds of egregious, you know, one strike and you're out kind of violation of safety, serious issues, are, are those communicated to the employee as such? And how often do those kinds of situations happen in your experience? 
Uh, so communication, absolutely. Uh, whether it's a minor infraction or major infraction, absolutely, it's, it, absolutely it's communicated. Um, does it happen often as far as egregious? No. Um, I can uh, say in the past five years, I can really only think of one moment in time where it was immediate termination. Um, people's safety was at risk on the side of a road, which also uh, turned into an environmental issue. Um, so just total blatant disregard of multiple company, state, and federal rules and laws. So in that case, on the spot, communicated, but on the spot termination. Um, again, but I can't, I can't think of many times that's happened in the recent past. Um, minor infractions, absolutely. We, we, you know, we're a larger company. We do have a, a, a step um, uh, process, um, but we also reserve the right for immediate termination if it warrants it. And it's not willy nilly. We invest a lot of time and training in every employee in our company, whether it's you're running a hand shovel or you're a project manager um, running millions of dollars of work. I hear you, great, thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you, sir, for your testimony. Thank you, I appreciate your time. Next up, unless I am mistaken, is Nikki, followed by Peter Gore. Oh, I'm sorry, my mistake. Matthew Marks is next. There we go. Thank you. Appreciate it, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> I too am uh, I missed lunch, so I feel your pain. Uh, thank you, members of the committee. Uh, I'm I'm going to spend the time sort of covering this stuff. I, I provided written testimony. My name is Matt Marks. I'm with Associated General Contractors of Maine, and I live uh, in Scarborough. Um, the Associated General Contractors of Maine has uh, been in existence here since 1951. We have a National presence is over 100 years old, so we've been around quite a while. Me, not not as long. But. Um, so, what I want to address today, in my outside of my written testimony, after listening to the other folks, I can tell you that we concur. I think Mr. Grandin laid out a couple of good examples, uh, but specifically, I know there was a request in that we stick to the parts of the policy that we saw as troublesome. So, I'll do that. Uh, so, for me, there are three layers: there's the policy, the law, and the regulations, and then the layoff scenario. Uh, for the law and the regulations, I think it was clear that adding uh, federal uh, laws to that is uh, very important. Uh, specifically for us, if there is an OSHA violation, which Mr. Grandin just alluded to, uh, there are some there that certainly can be used as a disciplinary policy where there may be multiple uh, pathways to correcting. And then there are others that are so egregious that should be uh, resulting in, in termination. Uh, the same, and that obviously for an OSHA violation, I'm assuming that if you wrote this policy, it should include law and regulations that we have to follow, whether it be environmental or labor violations. On a policy perspective, I think a couple of the challenges that we see, uh, companies may have a higher standard than state law. So for example, a weapons policy that a company has to either adhere to their client or to adhere to their own standards. Um, certainly if somebody violated that, and the company felt that it was a risk or a hazard to not only their customers, but also to fellow coworkers. I would hope that can be addressed and that should include up to termination, uh, depending on what the circumstances were. Uh, the same holds true for us in any work that was done where there could be a situation where somebody hid or concealed defective work. Uh, certainly the kind of uh, activity that our folks are involved in include building infrastructure. That's critical to not only water wastewater or highway bridge, and vertical construction, hiding or concealing defective work, in my opinion, should be available for termination. We may not violate a law per se. Now, the last piece that uh, I wanted to bring up, and I know several folks have alluded to the layoff or seasonality portion of this bill. Now, we have concern with that. If you take the paving season, for example, uh, that may end shortly after Thanksgiving, uh, we never know when we're gonna start up again. Uh, some folks are subject, subject to recall, while others are not, it really depends on the company's portfolio for the next year. And as you all know, that really depends on whether or not funding becomes available, whether it be federal or state. 
So I'll leave it at that. I'm happy to be available for the work session uh, as you start to work through these uh, various issues. And thank you for giving me the chance to speak today. Thank you, Mr. Marks. Questions from the committee. Seeing none. Thank you. You're welcome. Next up will be Nikki Morton, followed by Peter Gore, Robert Seavey, and Roger Krause. And we're almost there. Good afternoon. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I will do my very best not to be repetitive of previous testimony you've heard today, um, but Senator Hickman, Representative Sylvester, and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Labor and Housing, my name is Nikki Morton, and my husband and I own Casco Bay Food and Beverage, headquartered in Lewiston, and I reside in Auburn. We have three branches located in Bangor, Lewiston, and Portland, and currently employ 74 Mainers. Prior to the pandemic, we employed as many as 120 hardworking Mainers throughout the state. I'm speaking to you today in opposition of LD 555, an act to end Maine's at will employment status. This bill completely restructures Maine's current employment law regarding employment discharges. Considering the current global pandemic, this bill would prohibit an employer from furloughing in order to survive the devastating drop in revenue. This could and most likely would bankrupt most small, in, small business uh, businesses in the state. Could you imagine if this law had been in effect last March? We are in a business services industry. We have employees that service a single client. If that client terminates our services, um, we many times get very little or no notice. And this bill would prohibit us from being able to lay off or terminate the employee who services this single account. If we have a client that decides they no longer want one of our employees servicing their account for whatever reason, we would not be able to terminate this employee under this bill, even if we would have no other account for them to service. This bill states that if an employee breaks the law, we can terminate their employment without notice. However, due process could take several months or years for them to have determined to have broken the law. Anti-business legislation such as this will certainly deter other businesses from moving to our state. In fact, it could drive existing businesses to move their operations or employment base somewhere else entirely. All business mergers may cease to exist. What business would want to merge with another company and be forced to retain every employee regardless of their intended business model? Just wouldn't happen. Business owners recognize that our employees are our most treasured assets. They are also, in most cases, our most expensive asset. It costs employers tens of thousands of dollars to replace an employee. You have a period of time when the roles and responsibilities are not being fulfilled. You need to advertise to find a new employee. You have to train that new employee and you have a lack of productivity while that new employee masters their role. We need our employees to run our businesses successfully and usually make every effort to make a relationship work and prosper for everyone involved. I urge the committee to not act erroneous legislation on employers who are already struggling to remain viable. Thank you and I welcome any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Morton. Are there any questions? Seeing none. Thank you. Ne Thank you. Next up will be Mr. Peter Gore, followed by Roger Krause, Steve DeMillo, and Victoria Wallach. Good afternoon, Senator Hickman and yes. Representative uh, and Representative Sylvester and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Labor and Housing. Um, thank you for your patience in waiting through all this testimony today. The difficult part when you get to this point in the hearing is what do you say that's different that you haven't already heard about this bill? I'm going to try and just touch on a couple of things. First of all, there's been some discussion about whether a written statement of uh, termination of employment. You should know that Maine already has that law. It's in Title 26, Section 630. Um, and you may want to take a look at that as you go forward. Um, the issue of employment at will has been discussed and debated in this committee in the past. Um, in 2000, it was LD 2147, and in 2003, it was LD 1117, and a lot of the same issues that have come up today came up then. The bill is fraught with problems um, and will encourage litigation. 
there is a private right of action in section 3705 in this bill. And because of the vagueness of the violation of statute and the issue around layoffs, both of which you've heard about, that will only be settled by a judge or a jury. And that requires, that means litigation and costs for small businesses. Lastly, I wanna talk about the impact on other employees that folks have um, already uh, discussed and touched on. I couldn't tell you today for certain whether an employer um, would discharge an employee for the deliberate neglect of mandatory safety procedures that resulted in another employee's injury. But under LD 553, they could be neglectful three more times. I could not tell you for certain today whether an employer would immediately discharge an employee for being drunk at work and operating a heavy vehicle, a heavy machinery or vehicle, but they could be drunk three more times at work under this bill. And I cannot tell you for certain whether an employer would discharge immediately an employee for bringing a loaded firearm to the workplace despite an employer's strict no weapons policy, but they could bring their weapon to work three more times under OD 553. This isn't always about protecting the, in, in the employee in question. It's also at times about protecting their fellow employees. We are strongly opposed to LD 553 and we strongly urge you to give this an on not to pass recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gore. Are there any questions from the committee? Seeing none. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for being here. Roger Krause will be next, Steve DeMillo and Victoria Wallach. And if I pronounced your name incorrectly, please, you will let me know. <laughs> um, it looks like Roger Krause has left. So I'm going to go ahead and promote Steve DeMillo. Okay, great. Thank you, Alyssa. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Hi, sorry for that delay. Good afternoon, Senator Hickman, Representative Sylvester, members of the Labor and Housing Committee. My name is Steve DeMillo. I represent my family. We operate DeMillo's on the water, and I'm opposed to LD 553. I appreciate, your, um, appreciate the opportunity to address this situation. I'll try not to be redundant in my comments. As much as I know this legislation is well intended, if passed as written, uh, will prevent employers to sometimes take necessary action for the safety of all. It'll be in conflict of that. If a business faces a situation where activity could result in legal action against the business, a three-step process of termination is just not practical. One example is something that occurs in the workplace, substance or alcohol abuse. These incidents are difficult to prove, but after five decades in the business, I know when I see it. And sometimes termination of employment is prudent and necessary. The overwhelming majority of businesses in Maine are grateful for their hard work and dedication from their staff. There is a reason why there is only one state in the nation where employment at will has been eliminated. The system works as is and doesn't need fixing. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. DeMillo. Good to see you again. Are there any questions from the committee? Seeing none. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Victoria Wallach. Welcome. Are you ready for me? Yes. Oh, hi. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, Senator Hickman, Representative Sylvester, and members of the Labor and Housing Committee. I am Victoria Wallach, um, Communications and Government Relations Director for Maine School Management, representing the Maine School Boards Association and Maine School Superintendents Association in opposition to LD 553. Uh, the bill is unnecessary for schools because our only a negligible fraction of school employees now lack 
legally enforceable job security. Um, school employees are protected by overlap, excuse me, overlapping provisions, including collective bargaining agreements, individual contracts, and statutes, um, which give them a choice of remedies if they were terminated without just cause. It's also critical to understand that our first responsibility as school leaders is to do what is in the best interest of students and to keep them safe. Most school employee terminations result from the need to protect and properly educate children. This would tilt the balance in favor of the employee over the student. The bill also invites litigation. It says an employee has no private right of action under this chapter, except, except that an employee may file a lawsuit at any time. He or she claims the employer did not follow the progressive disciplinary policy required by law. Under this law, every single employment termination, as we see it, could be litigated. It also sets up a system of progressive discipline, which again, we believe is not in the best interest of the students we serve. It requires the first step must always be limited to a verbal warning, no matter how bad the behavior has been, unless the employee has violated state law. And no matter how egregious the behavior, the employee is given multiple chances to repeat it. We would add that the collective bargaining agreement invariably have progressive discipline requirements that are suited to school employment. Um, if this law is passed, those policies will conflict with and greatly complicated existing progressive discipline protocols. Um, in fact, there is no exception in the statute for individuals covered by collective bargaining agreements or other contracts. Um, an employee who is a member of a collective bargaining unit could grieve the termination as we see it through arbitration and could also file a lawsuit under this law, either simultaneously or consecutively. This bill also does not provide any time frame for allowing an employer to make a determination regarding whether or not a new employee is capable of successfully performing the job. Um, this was an important discussion we had last uh, session regarding a bill that is up again this year, um, LD-775, um, and it was the definition, I'm almost finished, uh, of public employee. And we are happy with what we now see in that bill. Um, during the probationary period, an employee may be dismissed, suspended, or otherwise disciplined without cause. Dismissal, suspension, or any other disciplinary action an employee um, against an employee during the probationary period is not a subject to the grievance and arbitration provision of the collective bargaining agreement. And this will be before your committee, um, I assume, shortly. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions. And thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Ms. Wallach. Are there any questions from the committee? I do not see any hands raised. Yes. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. And at this time, that are all the, those are all the people who have signed up to testify because of technical issues. I will do a last call for testimony. And if anyone was erroneously not signed up, please, please make that clear to our clerk at this time. I'll give you a minute, 30 seconds. nothing from our clerk. And so I will go to Representative Drinkwater who has a question for yes. the committee. Yes, Mr. Chair, thank you. And uh, I like that flag behind you too, Mr. Chair. I have a couple in my house also. Uh, for the work session, yes. I think it would be prudent upon us to actually hear from our analysts the steps that a person that feels they've been wrongly terminated can follow through the process, as we heard from Mr. Rowland earlier about the Maine Human Rights Commission. I would like to know the process for filing a claim and pursuing it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. Anyone else have any issues that they would like or questions for the work session information we would ask our analysts to gather? I would like to know how the laws work in the two territories that were referred to, Puerto Rico, and I can't remember the other one off the top of my head, 
um, what those provisions are for no at-will employment in those territories. Any other requests for work session? If the Department of Labor has the statistics on how many people have been let go without cause, I would like to have that number. Excellent. Senator uh, Representative Warren. Thank you, Senator Guerin. Representative Warren. I may need to follow up uh, with Steve after the fact that there was some, someone who testified somewhere in my notes about the, um, some, I think Portland area lawsuit um, and having to do with uh, when we, when we're talking about laws like this around at well employment, that there's other elements, I guess, to consider that are maybe smaller in different ways. I don't know if anyone rem remembers what I'm speaking about, but again, that because it was in the state of Maine um, and seemed relevant. Uh, but anyway, yeah. Thank you, Representative. We will see what we can find out before work session on that matter. Anyone else with any questions? Great. Well, thank you all for your day. Thank you all for those who are listening and who have testified. Um, with nothing else, Alyssa, do you have anything that you would like to uh, talk to me? Oh, I'm okay. Thanks for checking, though. You're welcome, always. With that, I am going to say that the Joint Committee on Labor and Housing, oh, wait, let's see, one second. I've got a message in chat. Oh, okay. Yeah, Jeffrey Young is the person who mentioned the lawyer. We'll, we, will, we will reach out to him and find out if he can be a part of the work session. And if we have any questions for him before that, hopefully he can submit them to us. We won't necessarily have to call him up at that point, but we'll, we'll circle back. We'll circle the wagons and make sure we have all we need to make an informed decision about this bill in our work session forthcoming. And with that, the joint standing- Mr. Mr. Chair, yes. I, I believe that Mr. Young did eventually testify. No, he did. I think he did. Yes, I believe he did. He did testify. But he, and he mentioned a couple. Thank you very much. And he did mention a couple of things. I'm sorry. I, I, I'll no, up for the, yeah. That was the person who testified that uh, Representative Warren was referring to. And so we'll make sure that whatever he said that she needs clarity about will be, be ready for us um, at the work session. Anything else? Seeing nothing, hearing nothing. Uh, the Joint Standing Committee on Labor and Housing is adjourned. Good day. Have a good one, everyone.